Good morning. Today is Thursday, February 3rd, 2022. Welcome to the land use meeting of the Board of County Commissioners. It is a beautiful day in Manatee County, and here in Manatee County, we start every day the same way. We start by honoring God and by honoring our great nation. Today, the invocation will be given by Reverend Brock Patterson of the Longboat Island Chapel, after which we will have the Pledge of Allegiance, which will be started by a special guest, Jorge Arana. If you're able, please stand. Gracious and heavenly God, we give you thanks, Lord, for the glory and for the beauty of this day. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity that we have to come together to do our very best, Lord, to further our community. Lord, we thank you for your blessings of health and safety upon all of us gathered here, Lord. And also, we ask your blessings, Lord, upon those whom you have called into leadership, Lord, those who are guiding us and who are leading us. I just ask your blessings upon them and on their families. Guide them in all things, Lord, as, as they do their very best to, to be called into your service and to do your work. Again, Lord, this is a great day, and it's a wonderful day when we're able to come together to honor you and to honor each other in our community. We offer this in your holy name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Reverend. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. I to read off his Boy Scout record. All right. Ms. Shank, are there any changes to today's agenda? Yes, there's an update memo. Wizina, do you want to outline the update memo? Yes, good morning. BDR 2103 CG Mangrove Cove. There is a um, revised site plan with minor changes to notes and public comment attached, and it's, these changes are in the agenda uh, management system. Is that all? Well, <laughs> all right, we're moving right along. Thank you. We'll move into citizen comments on future agenda items. Are there any citizens who would like to come forward to speak on agenda items that are not on this agenda but will be on future agendas? Seeing none, we'll go to the phone. There is no one on the phone either. Thank you. We're going to move right along. Ms. Shank, will you begin to uh, introduce the first item on the agenda, please? Okay, the first item is a presentation upon request. It's quasi-judicial. It's a proposed resolution R22006 or alternatively R22005 regarding the appeal of administrative determination 2131. This public hearing is going to be re-advertised to a date yet to be determined. So no action is required to be taken by the board, and there's no public comment at this point. Would any commissioner like a presentation on this item? Okay, seeing none, no action is required, Ms. Shank. Okay, the item number two is rezoning Z2108. The applicant is called Forever Up Homes LLC. This is a presentation upon request. It involves a rezone from RSF 4.5 to RDD 6 for 0.34 acres, generally located north of Cortez Road in the corner of 30th Avenue West and 26th Street West at 3803 26th Street West. This is quasi a public hearing. So we have to disclose ex parte communications, but it's a presentation upon request. Would anyone like to disclose any ex parte communication involving this agenda item? All right, seeing none, Rosina, will you be presenting today? No. Oh, I'm sorry, it's applicant presentation, I apologize. It's, uh, it's open yeah. request if you would like a presentation. Would anyone like a presentation? I would just like something basic so the public knows, sure. you know, what we've done. Mr. Chairman, I need to swear people in. Go ahead. Will you please rise so I can administer the oath? If you plan to testify for any of the items, this is what this is for. Do you swear or affirm that the factual statements and factual representations which you are about to present to the board will be truthful and accurate? I do. Thank you. Okay, let's start with applicant presentation, please. 
Good morning, Honorable Chair, Board Members. My name is Kevin. Yes, ma'am. We're going to do with the applicant presentation, Kevin. A little introduction first. I don't know if Kevin's not buying this. So you're going to come up to the podium. <laughs> Tell us your name. Tell us your name and your county of residence. Yeah. Hi, my name is Julian Aguilar. I'm the engineer. I'm the Manatee County residence. I'm the engineer for this project. And the owner is uh, Rafael Gonzalez. He's here next to me. Great. Thank you. We're looking for a brief app. Uh, a brief presentation by you. For by me or by the? You or your, either you or the owner, whichever you choose. But it's, it's your opportunity to speak first and to present to us first. Staff will present after you. You can waive the option uh, to make a presentation to us if you choose and go straight to staff. It's up to you. Oh, no. Go directly You'll to defer to staff? With the staff. Okay. okay. Mr. Aguilar, were you sworn? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. We're going to then move to staff presentation. Kevin, go ahead. All right. Thank you, sir. My name is Kevin Oatman. I'm with Pan uh, Build and um, Build and Development Services, and I've been sworn in. The project here is the Z21-08. So the proposed um, rezone is from the RSF 4.5 to RDD6. The parcel, which is about three four, excuse me, 0.34 acres, is located just north of Cortez, off of 26 mm -hmm. and 38th Avenue. Um, Again, he is proposed to go to the RD66 district zoning. There are adjacent properties that are zoned RDD6. Surrounding it is mixed with office as um, office of professional as well as neighborhood commercial. So again, he is proposing to add a little bit about 600 square feet onto the existing dwelling. <coughs> so that he can possibly do a duplex there. Um, and everything seems to be consistent because of the surrounding development and the surrounding zonings. Um, it all meets land development code and the comprehensive code. So I, that's in the planning commission back last month on January 13th, uh, recommended approval for this. Thank you. Great, thank you, Kevin. Commissioner Whitmore is the only commissioner on the board. Go ahead, Commissioner Whitmore. Yeah, I just want to state that this I've been, we've all probably been by this area right. a thousand times, so it's a great infill project, and I'm glad we're doing some kind of redevelopment. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Commissioner Whitmore. We'll go to public comments on this item. Is there anyone who would like to come forward from the public to speak on this agenda item? Okay. Seeing no one, we'll go to the phone. Is there anyone on the phone to speak on this agenda item? Actually, it's quasi-judicial, so it doesn't really matter. Um, we're going to close public comment. Kevin, do you have any further statements you'd like to make? No, sir. Okay. Thank you. Um, does the applicant have any statement they'd like to make? Move. Okay. I'll entertain motions. Mr. Chair. Sir. I make move the, uh, the recommended motion. Let me read it all. You say the one for approval. The one for approval. Mm -hmm. Okay. We have a motion by Commissioner Bellamy. Does he have a second? Second. And we have a second by Commissioner Baugh. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Madam Clerk, it passes unanimously. Ms. Shank, please introduce the next agenda item. Okay. This is presentation scheduled. Item number three, application PDC 2105ZG for Hammer Crossing, Plaza Judicial. This is a rezoning of approximately 13.35 acres from the A1 slash NCO, Suburban Agriculture North Central Overlay District to the PDC. NCO, Planned Parenthood Commercial, retaining the North Central Overlay District and approving a general development plan for up to 150,000 square feet of commercial uses upon and 13.35 acres located in UF3, future lands classification, generally located at the southwest corner of US 301 and Four Hammer Road at 12055 US 301, 5751 Four Hammer Road and 5851 Bella Road pa Parish. Um, that's all I have. Thank you, Ms. Shank. This is quasi-judicial. Is there an, any ex parte communication that needs to be disclosed? Okay, seeing none, we'll go to the applicant. Is the applicant here to make a presentation? All right, Mr. Barnaby. Good morning, commissioners. And it is a wonderful morning in Mantee County. It is clear why we live here as opposed to some other places up north today in particular. Flattery um, will not work, Mr. Barnaby. Yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> Got him. There you go. Um, uh, I am Mark Barnaby. I have been sworn. 
and uh, I have a master's in urban planning uh, from Florida State. With me today are Ryan uh, Plate of Ferber and Will Anderson of Ferber, Mike Costello of the Avid Group, and Michael Yates, or Mitchell Yates, excuse me, of Palm Traffic, and uh, the latter two gentlemen will be assisting me on this presentation. Um, there we go. Okay, let's see if this works today. Um, ooh, excellent. Uh, this is uh, this is the site location. It is this area is where we're at. We're actually in the southwest corner of uh, Fort Hamer Road and US 301. Uh, this property um, is uh, across the street from a relatively new 7-Eleven as well as a relatively new uh, Dollar General store, and it uh, it is an area that is developing in this site. We'll talk about that a little more in a second. This is also I just want to make note uh, for your benefit and part of the record that this is the area where Fort Hamer Road is going to be extended. Um, I think um, everyone is pretty much aware of that and this area is changing rapidly uh, with uh, the development that is occurring in that area. So uh, I will. I do want to know before I begin with this, present, this part of the presentation that uh, in, 1960, in the 1960s this area was originally zoned agricultural. That agricultural designation stayed all the way uh, through the 81 zoning uh, code as well as the 1989 zoning code and it is uh, zoned that way today. Uh, but this area has changed a lot. Um, back in those days this was more cows than cars and uh, that has changed a lot in this period of time. So <clears throat> this is the 2003 aerial. This, this site you can see that the site um, which basically uh, is on that corner of uh, what would be Fort Hamer now. And you can kind of see the uh, the roadway shown in there. It was a tree farm. Um, it was still an active tree farm at that time. Uh, Fort uh, excuse me, US 301 was just in the process of getting four lane. Um, and, uh, and so this road has, uh, this area has, was at that point. Now in 2008, you can see some of the improvements going in. You can see US 301 now is four lane. Um, Lake, Lakeside Preserve, which is just to our south, and to our west um, is be in the process of being developed. The tree farm is not as active as it was, certainly uh, back in 2003, and we still have Fort Hamer Road running due north. 2014, you can see Fort Hamer Road now being relocated uh, from where it was. The tree farm is no longer operational um, in any significant uh, fashion at all. And uh, there was further realignment on uh, changes on US 301. And so um, we can see, we can see uh, significant changes in, in just this area alone. And of course, Fort Hamer Road, the bridge has been constructed across there. And this is going to be, and I'll probably say this again, a very busy intersection one day. Hey, there we go. The zoning on this, uh, the comprehensive plan designation on this site is uh, Res 6, um, and, or excuse me, UF 3, and Res 6 is just to our north. Um, this is a commercial node, obviously, and uh, that's why this is appropriate for this site. And now you can see the zoning in the area. Obviously, as we talked about, we are A1, but there is PDC across the street as well as up and down US 301 at this point. <clears throat> we did have a neighborhood workshop. Um, we had about 30 people in attendance. It was well attended, uh, a lot of comments. Um, uh, we did have one person uh, that was uh, particularly concerned. She has submitted comments that are in your record. She largely was looking at the prior site plan that had been approved by the Planning Commission at one point, um, and uh, I think that's where her concerns are. Uh, as we will talk about, um, one of the nice things about this project is the buffer between the Lakeside Preserve. I will give Lakeside Preserve tons of credit. It has some of the best uh, buffer management I've ever seen, and you'll see pictures of that in just a few minutes. And it's a very healthy and vibrant buffer between the two projects. At this point, I want to turn it over to Mike Costello, and he's going to go through the site plan and a little more detail about the project. Good morning. Uh, Mike Costello with Avid Group. I'm the civil engineer on this project. I'm also the engineer of record, and I have been sworn. As Mr. Brembry introduced the project, it is located at the southwest corner of Fort Hamer Road and 301. Uh, there's currently an access point off of 301, as well as one access, 
or actually two access points off of 301 and one off of Fort Hamer Road. Uh, you can see the southern portion of the property is heavily wooded at this point, which is the remnants of that tree farm. They're, they've been planted in rows and, and just have uh, been left in the field to continue to grow. Uh, to our south is the residential development Mr. Brembry talked about previously. Uh, this is a colored version of the general development plan which we submitted as part of this application. Uh, within green are the proposed buffers surrounding the property. So to the west and to the south are 20 foot uh, uh, as well as call it the southeast portions <coughs> of the road uh, of the property. Uh, those are 20 foot NCO overlay um, perimeter buffers. On the roadway, since these are both thoroughfare roadways, the requirement would be a 50 foot NCO buffer. Uh, we are proposing 25 and I'll go through that in a little bit more detail. Also within in the blue coloring is the proposed stormwater pond on the property. So uh, at this point it hasn't been fully designed. This is a general development plan which allows us for some flexibility as we uh, proceed with final site plans. Uh, but generally based on staff comments during our pre-application meetings as well as comments received from the neighbors, uh, we thought it was most appropriate to locate the pond on that uh, call it southwest corner of the property as well as along the southern boundary of the property thereby pushing our development further towards the north towards the intersection and that's where we want to focus our, our development and try and increase the distance between the residential property and the back of our proposed development. Uh, we are also proposing to modify the the triangular shaped pond that's in the, the southeast corner of the property is actually within the county right-of-way and that's a county stormwater management facility. We are proposing to slightly modify that pond to allow us to propose the, inner, the driveway connection to, three, uh, to Fort Hamer, which is aligned opposite of Bella Road. That location is important because with that, we're proposing left turn lanes in both directions. Uh, and therefore, you really need to align those two roadways across from each other. Otherwise, if they were offset, the left turn lanes would prevent any full access movement from crossing there in the future. We're also proposing a right in right out driveway about midpoint along Fort Hamer Road. That also includes a right turn lane. As well as we've met with uh, DOT, we went through AM <coughs> AMRC, which is their uh, approval process for a preliminary design. And we were uh, granted approval with the right in right out driveway located approximately midpoint on 301. Uh, in order to provide that, we are proposing to uh, construct a right turn lane along the frontage of 301, as well as extend the right turn lane that currently provides access to the uh, adjacent residential property. Um, but Mr. Yates can go into a little bit further detail on those specifics. Uh, as Mr. Brembry previously indicated, these are some existing photos of the buffer that is located just to the south of our property. So when the uh, subdivision was created to our south, they were required to install a 20 foot wide buffer. Uh, also note that we are going to install a 20 foot wide buffer to the north of that property line. So effectively you'll have a 40 foot buffer between the fence line of the residential properties and our property. And then beyond that, there'll be uh, stormwater ponds and, and we'll increase the distance as much as possible to minimize that or maximize that separation. Uh, there's one more photo for your education there. Uh, as you can see, it's, there's a swale located between the property. Uh, the two properties, the swale intercepts runoff um, from the on the residential portion of the property. And you can see it's pretty well maintained and the vegetation is pretty heavy. We have two specific approval requests that we've uh, entered as part of this application. Uh, the first one I mentioned previously, which is in regards to the NCO required thoroughfare buffers. Uh, so typically NCO requires a 50 foot uh, buffer along both road frontages. We've requested to reduce that to 25 feet. It's our understanding that that's consistent with other projects that are within this area up and down 301 that they have previously requested a 25 foot reduction. Uh, also, it's our understanding that the NCO is potentially being removed from this general area, but that has not uh, actually proceeded yet. Uh, if the NCO overlay was removed, then the buffers would be 20 foot. 
So we're actually proposing still to maintain a 25 foot buffer, which is in excess of what the requirements would be. Also note that as part of our request, the uh, vegetation that's typically required within that 50 foot NCO buffer will be installed. It'll just be installed in a, in a little bit more dense uh, area within that 25 feet. Our second specific approval request, uh, so we're proposing as part of our negotiations with tenants, there's a few tenants that have uh, requirements for not, not installing landscape islands in front of their front door of their building per se. Uh, so the code requirement has a maximum of 10 parking spaces in a row. And we're requesting to relieve, uh, for relief from that request in that one singular location. So we're requesting to go up to 15 parking spaces in a row in one location. Um, note that we are also proposing to take the landscape area and plant material that would normally be within those islands and provide that. It'll just be slightly larger islands on either side of those 15 cars in a row. Uh, with that, I'd like to turn it over to Mr. Yates, our traffic consultant, who can go into further detail about the Fort Hamer roadways and and access. Thank you. Good morning, Michael Yates with Palm Traffic, and I have been sworn. Um, just wanted to go through a little bit of the traffic with you. As, as everyone's mentioned, there's a lot of changes happening here. We've gone through a lot of effort to get to this point on a GDP that normally isn't part of the GDP process, but wanted to make sure that we've worked through the access points and worked through some of the traffic concerns up front and worked out what some of those improvements would be as part of the GDP, so we all knew what they were. Um, as you can see, this is a overlay of the county's proposed improvements to the intersection that are currently going through design that shows the extension north, the modifications to the south, and some modifications on 301 as well. Um, in this next slide, this kind of details the uh, proposed access improvements uh, specific to the site. Uh, along US 301, you can see that the eastbound or northbound right turn lane on US 301 at Fort Hammer will go all the way back to our proposed driveway. And then we will have another driveway for uh, another turn lane for our driveway, which is shown there as the first right, first driveway there uh, from Fort Hammer. And then what we are doing is extending that turn lane all the way back to Red Rooster. Uh, which will, which is the intersection to the west, which will give a long turn lane for that whole section. Uh, that was part of the discussions with FDOT, and we went through an AMRC Access Management Review Committee to get to the access point. This allows for the project to access 301 and doesn't put all the burden of the traffic onto Fort Hammer at the intersection, and so. We all felt it was important, DOT agreed. It just took a lot of process and a lot of discussions to get to this point. Um, along Fort Hammer, we're proposing the right in, right out, uh, just south of the intersection. That will have a full length right turn lane to serve that. And then we have the full median opening to the south that aligns with Bella Road. Uh, as part of that, we would be building the southbound left turn lane for Bella Road, a northbound left turn lane for our driveway, and a southbound right turn lane for our driveway. So this would provide very good access for the project and fit within the road configuration that Manatee County is doing as part of their improvements for Fort Hammer. Um, I would be happy to answer any detailed questions, uh, but that is kind of the overview of the traffic improvements. All right, thank you. Commissioner Whitmore, you're first on the board. Mark's, Mark's done yet. Oh, I'm sorry. Speaking. That's okay. I've got uh, just real quickly. Uh, staff has recommended 12 stipulations. We have no objection to those stipulations for the record. Um, Planning Commission voted 7-0 in favor of this project. Um, and I will note that during the uh, neighborhood meeting, uh, somebody suggested that we should put uh, residential on this site, meant multifamily, and that was roundly booed. Uh, <laughs> and so I just can note that for the record. This is consistent with the conference plan and the land development code. And we request your approval. Thank you, Mr. Barnaby. Commissioner Whitmore, and Satcher, Servia. Commissioner Whitmore. Thank you for bringing that part up. I don't think this would be compatible, this commercial node for a residential, so I'm glad that you addressed that. 
there was public comment. I read um, the citizens had asked if you would consider more of kind of a rural feel of what the shopping center, whatever this commercial business is going to be. And I think there's a dollar store right across the street from it that they had to go through the same thing where the facade looked a little more incompatible with Paris. So I'm sure you guys have read that and you've taken that in consideration. But I would respectfully ask that you consider what the citizens are. And you know, it does fit because right now directly across the street, the dollar store was one of our first commercial buildings when we um, did this overlay and um, to me it doesn't look commer uh, it doesn't look as commercial as some others so if you would just take that in consideration uh, citizens had uh, comments about lighting but in the mitigation you'd you addressed it about it's going to be in compliance with code and I did write commercial no this to me uh, is compatible for a commercial no not residential that's all thank you Thank you, Commissioner Whitmore. Commissioner Satcher. Is there a plan on the south entrance there on Fort Hammer? Uh, is there any plan for a light there or no? Again, Michael Yates. Um, we have not evaluated it. I mean, it's a little close to the intersection, but there definitely is that possibility. I mean, with the commercial node, once we get going through the PSP FSP process, that's when we'll get into the evaluation of how it functions. Are there any operational issues that would require it to be signalized? Remind me, is that four lanes there or two? Uh, it will be four lanes essentially. You're going to have all the turn lanes and everything. Um, so I will tell you that the right turn out on US 301 will help alleviate those lefts that are trying to make that across there. So. My guess is it would not meet signal warrants, but as we get through the process and evaluate it, we'll figure that out for sure. So I bring that up probably just to um, give staff a heads up of a concern I have. Um, as you had, I'm going to go to a different situation and then relate it. Um, on Highway 64, if you're heading east and then you get to Lakewood Ranch Boulevard, uh, there's a Publix there. And so I had to drop my son off uh, for a basketball game at Hale. And so I pulled in there to get a drink or something, and which I used to go there all the time, but it has gotten extremely busy. And they're really, I thought, you know, I don't mind just punching it, you know, and hitting the gas and doing what you got to do. Um, but I felt sorry for some people. I thought, goodness, if my grandmother was here, uh, there's no safe way out of that whole in entire, there's nowhere to go because you have to cross all of Lakewood Ranch Boulevard. And so just looking forward, I want us to start seeing situations like that and seeing if we can figure out something for them to do um, so that if they're taking a ride on 301 in this instance, um, obviously they'd have to get to that turn lane really fast if they want to go north or if they want to turn around. So maybe a spot where they can do a U-turn later uh, down the road. On uh, Highway 64, uh, you can do a U-turn there, but there's really not space to do it if you take a right and continue to go east to go west. I know that's confusing if you don't know the, the shopping center that I'm talking about, but if you do know that shopping center, you know it's a pain. And uh, so I just want us to try to look for creative solutions for uh, situations like that in the future, because obviously uh, this is going to be a good place for commercial. I think that, uh, you know, the residents there are going to enjoy it. Somebody needs to call Chick-fil-A and Wawa. Um, and uh, so, you know, it's going to be a good thing for the residents, but I also want us to try to think ahead, even just a small thing like a spot for somebody to turn around might be a, a good thing for, uh, for some of our residents. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Satcher. Commissioner Servia. Um, yes, thank you. Thank you for the great presentation. I just have a couple of questions, and um, it's because I worked on this project years ago, and I remember when we worked on it, that it is an area that floods quite a bit. Um, and so I see your stormwater is probably going to be in the southwest corner. But are you planning, did I hear you say you're only going to reconfigure that um, stormwater pond that takes in the Fort Hamer runoff? You're not going to use that pond for any of your off-site runoff, is that correct? Uh, yes, that is correct. Oh, sorry, Mike Costello with Avid Group. Yes, that is correct. Uh, our part of our stipulation so we have actually done full stormwater design on this property already even though it's not required at this point with the application um, we are meeting the 50% reduction in runoff from the property as stipulated by your code 
Uh, we're also addressing any flooding in the area as well, so will there'll be no net in rise in, in floodwaters on, associated with this project. Uh, we are relocating a, just a portion of that existing county stormwater pond, and that's really only to allow for the uh, alignment of our proposed driveway. Uh, but we will not be utilizing that pond for any of our stormwater runoff that isn't already directed to it. Okay. And then I heard um, that you met with DOT, which is great, and you plan uh, a write-in, write-out on US 301. I heard it was going to be on the west side, and then I heard it was going to be in the center. And I see there's a wetland on the west side. So are you planning to impact that wetland? Do you know at this time? Yeah, I, I can address the wetland portion of that. Uh, it is a very low quality wetland. Um, if we refer back to the existing conditions, the, the wetland is actually in, in a basically a pasture area currently. We were surprised it was even designated as a wetland, but our consultant has indicated that it's very low quality. Okay, so you could push that access then all the way to the western boundary. The, say no uh, and Mr. Yates can address okay. the, the location of that driveway. All right, thank you. If we can go back to the PowerPoint presentation. Um, you can see the driveway there. Uh, once you get past the right turn lane, uh, you see that little driveway that's right there. That's the proposed driveway location. It's a little west of center, but that's the location. That's the location that we've agreed to with DOT. We have to keep separation from the neighborhood driveway that's immediately to the west. So there needs to be a little separation between there, but there is no chance to move that. It took six months of negotiating with DOT to get that and that location. Got it. So, <laughs> so that's we cannot be. move that <laughs> yes. in any way. <laughs> and we're bound by the traffic numbers that we submitted to DOT. So we're really committed to that location and not increasing in any of the traffic. So. Okay, great. And then my last question is about tree mitigation. Have you guys talked about that? Um, seems there are quite a bit of, there are lots, lots of mature trees on site. Do you think you can replace them on site? So we've had conversations with staff and agreed to address tree mitigation at our final site plan application. Um, generally, our request was that there are some mature trees on, call it the north half of the property surrounding some of the buildings. The trees that are on, call it the southern half of the property, were planted as part of an agricultural operation. So we're negotiating right now with staff to determine how to best approach that for mitigation purposes. Okay. All right. Thank you. I, I might you. add to that, though, that uh, in our neighborhood meeting, we did talk to some folks about perhaps moving some of our stormwater to the western side and keeping more of the trees on the southern side, and that is something we are looking at very seriously. Okay. Thank you, Commissioner Servia. Commissioner Whitmore. It's somebody that knows about the traffic, so whoever wants to come up. Uh, isn't there... That would uh, be Michael. <laughs> yeah, isn't it like, if I recall, a thousand feet, you um, can't put another, uh, you can't put a light within a thousand feet of another light. Is it a thousand? Um, so it, typically Section. you will not get anything closer than 800. Uh, you typically like 1250. Um, so it really depends upon how they're designed, how they function, and what the coordination is between the two signals as far as timing. So you can get progression between two signals that allows for the timing to function correctly. Mm -hmm. Then you know you can get into that 800 to 1,000 feet. Okay. Um, we've that's kind of the separation we got. We ended up, a, <coughs> I think, the Bella Road's about 1,000 feet, maybe a little more than 1,000 feet uh, separation from 301. Ideally, it wouldn't have a signal, but it's located so that it could if it was needed. Okay, and then uh, isn't it true, I'm sure you probably know this, that in the past five or six, seven years, FDOT encourages U-turns now, uh, which a we're all as getting of used today, to. today, yes. Yeah. I can't tell you about tomorrow. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> today they encourage U-turns. I'm getting used to it. It's scary, but I'm getting used to it. And roundabouts, as we all know. Thank you, Commissioner Whitmore. Commissioner Cruz. I, I just, I just want to jump in. I wasn't going to say anything. Uh, yeah. It, it, no, but people have their own opinions. The, the light really doesn't make any sense here, and, and I know we're not <laughs> debating, but <laughs> here's the thing. The, the Publix we were talking about, I just watched the, the dangerous turnout of that Publix on 64 and Lakewood Ranch, 
is a left turn going south. Well, the issue with that public shopping center is the ingress egress on 64 doesn't allow you to make a left turn to ultimately hit the light and go south. So you have no choice but to gun it across like, like Commissioner Satcher apparently does. <laughs> this doesn't need a light at any point in time. If you're going to make a right out of this down Fort Hammer, you make a right. There's no issue. If you're going to make a left and it's dangerous because it's traffic or you're not James, then <laughs> you can make a right out onto 301 and get to the exact same intersection. You have the option of going the direction you want to go in a safe way without us needing to put a light there and further stifle traffic. It's, it's, it's different than the public, so I don't see any reason we would ever spend any money or tie up traffic even more than we already do with a light on that. So that's it. All right. Thank you, Commissioner Cruz. Uh, last on the board is Commissioner Satcher with a brief statement. <laughs> a brief statement. Just for the record, <laughs> for the record, I'm not advocating extra red lights, unneeded red lights. <laughs> I'm just trying to look forward. We're growing a lot, and so we need to think of some things ahead of time as we move forward. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Commissioner Satcher. Thank you, Mr. Barnaby. Uh, we're going to move into staff presentation. But we do know Who's Satcher presenting? guns are now. Who's presenting today? <laughs> okay. Way to go, James. Way to go. <laughs> Got a bit of business to decide, man. Hmm. Brown says black gloves now. Good morning, Commissioners. Dorothy Rainey for staff, and I have been sworn. I'll kind of go quickly through this because the applicants already pretty much covered everything. Could but you, if you're, could you just speak up a little louder? Okay. It's okay if you yeah, want to ask. Yeah, we can't understand you. Sorry. I guess I'll take out. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, just speak okay. So the request again is for a rezone of approximately 13.35 acres from the A1 and North Central overlay uh, to the planned development commercial, retaining the North Central overlay. Uh, approval of a general development plan for the commercial retail uses and associated infrastructure they're proposing of up to 150,000 square feet. Uh, it's three parcels, again, 13.35 acres total, um, A1 zoning, NCO, UF3, and the land is vacant, currently vacant. Um, again, future land use is um, UF3, and the zoning is uh, A1 currently. And I, I might mention um, the Dollar General is actually contained within the village zoning, so it has separate standards than what this site will be subject to, the North Central Overlay standards, just for, for reference. Um, there's an aerial close-up as well as zoomed out of the site. Um, the surrounding <coughs> uses, to the north you've got US 301 right away and the convenience store with gas pumps, the 7-Eleven, that's zoned PDC. To the south is the residential subdivision, the lakeside subdivision. To the east are large lot residences zoned A1, and to the west is the actual entrance area to the residential subdivision, a stormwater pond west of the roadway. I had a lot of photos <laughs> actually from the original project, <laughs> but I did get a, I believe I have an updated one of the 7-Eleven across the way. Oh, maybe not. <laughs> Sorry. Um, okay, so the there's the site. Um, in color there that the applicant also showed you. Um, you can see where the stormwater is proposed and where all the roadway buffers are, and they've already explained all those. Um, the access points, as they mentioned, are two of them off Fort Hamer. One is a full access and one is a right-in, right-out. Of course, the full access is the one proposed to align with the Bella Road. And there's one access point on US 301 as a right-in, right-out. Stormwater, again, is to the southeast as well as along the south property line. And based on the conceptual plan, or GDP, it'll be divided into three out parcels along US 301, and the balance will be a fourth parcel. The specific approvals they went over, but it's the typical um, request from a commercial use within the NCO is to reduce the 50-foot roadway buffer from uh, 50 feet to 25. And there's also a little segment of 36 feet where it goes down to 8 feet because there's a little triangle <coughs> of property that's still owned by the property owner <laughs> on the east side of Fort Hamer who um, gave up, I guess, property and the county was only allowed to purchase what they needed, so that got left over. <laughs> um, 
the positive aspects of this site, uh, the project is that it's located at a commercial node, which is appropriate for commercial and retail. It has frontage on US 301 and Fort Hamer Road, which are both classified as arterial roadways. And the commercial development is occurring along US 301 corridor and this intersection specifically, so timing is consistent with development trends in the area. The negatives, of course, is it abuts single family residences to the south, and there may be potential negative impacts rel relative to lights, glare, and noise. Um, but mitigating measures, as uh, Commissioner Whitmore had mentioned, there, we do um, require a lighting plan to be in compliance with LDC regulations at the time of final site plan approval. And also the site provides the required buffers and screening adjacent to residential. And as the applicant indicated, they're going to try to uh, make that distance between the residences and the um, commercial uses even as uh, more, you know, more of a um, separation if they can uh, adjust things on site as they develop the property. So we conclude that the request for the rezone to PDC with the general development plan as well as specific approvals and stipulations are all in compliance with both the comprehensive plan and the land development code. And that's it. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, the only commissioner on the board with a question is Commissioner Servia. Thank you. Thank you, Dorothy, mm -hmm. for the presentation. Just a couple of questions. So as I look at the attachment uh, that shows the list of uses, and I think that that's the list right out of the land development code. Correct. Um, mm -hmm. And then it shows the plan development zoning categories at the top. Mm -hmm. And so do I assume that the, the uses where the first line of the use is struck in red those are not going to be permitted on this site. Correct. Mm -hmm. And the uses that are not stricken but have an X at, under PDC also will not, not be alone. on this site. Correct. Is that correct? Yes, it is. Yes. Okay. Um, and I just, because of the public comment in the record, I wanted to ask you if um, in your review, did you find that all scenarios that could be built here are compatible with the residential to the south? Uh, yeah, I mean, we, we're going to rely on the um, Section 531, all those specific use criteria that require additional consideration to, you know, to create compatibility for those specific uses. So they're going to be subject to all those. And all, any other um, north central overlay, there's a little extra buffering, as they mentioned. Your uh, perimeter buffers increase to 20 feet. And the, ro the roadway buffer, of course, <laughs> like I said, is typically requested to reduce to 25 feet. But yes, I... I believe all the um, requirements in the code will address that or make them address any compatibility issues. Yeah. Thank you. Mm. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Commissioner Servia. Thank you, Dorothy. Mm -hmm. And no other commissioners on the board. I'm going to move into public comment. Is there anyone from the public who would like to come forward to speak on this specific agenda item? When you reach the podium, please state your name and your county of residence and be sure that your comments are directed towards this specific agenda item. Thank you. My name is Kara Byers, and I have been sworn in. You can leave your mask on. I just I need to speak up a little bit. Off. <laughs> uh, first of all, I want to say thank you um, for working with this project. I know uh, Ferber has worked with me as well. I am a homeowner on Bella Road. That is the east of the property. It used to be the old Fort Hammer Road. So this is... Um, property, we will get the lighting, we'll get the traffic, and so they've been working with me on that. So I agree with Mr. Satcher. It's for us to come, my daughter especially, when she comes out of Bella Road to make that left-hand turn onto Fort Hammer Road, she's already been al almost in two accidents. Because again, just the traffic, trying as you come up, trying to see to make that left-hand turn. So I know they're working with that, but I know it's not just them. It has to be the citizens, has to be the planning, has to be you all. So I ask that you keep looking into that. And again, thank you, Mr. Satcher, for bringing that up. Uh, and for Whitmore and Serbia, thank you for your questionings on this. But I'm just asking that, again, as you go through this, to please look into the safety, uh, the lighting, I know that the comments have been made about the houses to the south, but again, I will also be affected because as the cars are coming out of this property or this um, development, those lights will be into where we live. <laughs> so, and I know sooner or later the development's coming. So again, I really appreciate them working with us. But again, as a whole, I just ask that you think like Mr. Satcher is the future, what's in the future for us who are living there, especially on Bella Road. So thank you. 
Yeah. Thank you, ma'am. Is there anyone else who would like to speak on this specific agenda item? Seeing none, we'll close public comment and we'll move into closing statements by either staff or the applicant. Does staff have any final comments they'd like to make? Does the applicant have any final comments? Just briefly, I, I appreciate those comments from, from the public. I, the, um, I just want to reiterate Commissioner Cruz's comments that the logical traffic pattern for this site coming out of that entrance off of uh, Fort Hamer at Bell Road will, it doesn't make any sense to make a left turn there if you're <laughs> because there's a much easier, safer way if you just pull out on a 301. And so uh, I appreciate those comments and uh, we don't, I don't have any other comments other than that. Thank you. All right, thank you, Mr. Barnaby. Commissioner Serbia. Are we at deliberations? Yes, ma'am. Okay, thank you. So I really appreciate the great information shared here today. You know, this is an area where we not only expect commercial development, but we need commercial development. Um, what, this is what we call an activity node. And when you're surrounded by arterials virtually, I mean, this is going to be commercial development. It's not suitable for anything else. So I am going to be supportive of this today, and I wish you lots of luck. And thank you for working with the neighborhood. Thank you, Commissioner Serbia. Seeing no other commissioners on the board for deliberations, uh, the chair will entertain motions. I'll make a motion to approve the recommended motion by staff. Second. We have a motion by Commissioner Whitmore to approve the recommendation and a second by Commissioner Cruz. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Madam Clerk, it passes unanimously. Ms. Shank, will you please introduce the next agenda item? Thank you. Yes, Mr. Chairman, the next item is number five. It's application uh, number four. Sorry, number four. It's application PDR 2103ZG Mangrove Co Cove. Ms. Scott. And I did want to note, although the agenda indicates that the application is Lenox Enterprises, Inc., and a Mr. Kolb, that the property owner's name has changed and would be entered into the record. This is a rezone of approximately 57.55 acres, generally located 0.19 miles west of Palmasola Boulevard on the north side of Cortez Road having addresses at 43229 1st Street West and 9000 Cortez Road West. It's proposed rezoning from planted bomb residential, neighborhood commercial medium, and single family residential zone districts to the planted bomb residential zone district, retaining the following overlay districts, airport impact, coastal planning, and coastal evacuation areas. There's a proposed site plan Thank you, Rosie. which depicts approximately 100, I don't know why I don't see that here, 148 multifamily residential drawing units within Mandy Center. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Shank. Uh, anyone like to disclose any ex parte communication regarding this item? Okay, so the chair, I, at one point I had this property under contract in my career as a real estate agent, uh, not with this particular um, buyer and so not with this applicant, but I felt I should at least disclose that I have fairly extensive knowledge on the property. Um, moving forward, we will start with the applicant presentation. All right. Good morning, commissioners. Uh, for the record, I'm Scott Rudisill. Blaylock Walters here on behalf of the applicant, and I've been sworn. I did just want as a housekeeping item, I do have, our clients was the contract purchaser. They've closed on the property, so we do have um, updated ownership affidavit and zoning disclosure and deed. Wasn't sure where to hand it anymore, the new seating arrangement under the Van Austin Bridge administration here. <laughs> <laughs> Uh oh, you just got him ticked off. Yeah, flattery, flattery will get you nowhere. But. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, briefly want to introduce our development team here. Uh, we have Al Livnet and Blair Schlossberg with Mangrove Cove Properties. Mr. Schlossberg is here today with us. Uh, Rachel Layton <coughs> is our project planner. She's an AICP with ZNS. Uh, Nathan Crott, our civil engineer with ZNS. Uh, Michael Yates, our traffic engineer with Palm Traffic, is here today as well. And then Joel Christian with Ardura 
is our environmental consultant. All right, this is the project site. It's uh, approximately 57 and a half acres located on the north side of Cortez Road, just west of Pumasol Boulevard. Uh, the request is to rezone a portion of the site from NCM and RSF 4.5 to PDR with a general development plan for 44 townhome units and 104 multifamily units. Uh, the site has a little bit of a unique history, so I want to go into that a little bit before I turn it over to Rachel. Um, you'll see that the site contains uh, two different parcels. There's a smaller <coughs> five-acre parcel and then a 52 and a half acre parcel that's primarily coastal wetlands. Uh, the five acre parcel was the subject of some litigation with the county back in the 80s, uh, which resulted in a joint stipulation between the parties. That joint stipulation provides for the five acre parcel to have vested rights to develop at 12 units to the acre and uh, three story high to three stories over parking. Several years later, the five acre parcel was joined with the property to the west for a development project. And the first phase of that project was developed as Renacita, which you can see um, is the, the paired villas that you see there on the aerial just to the west of our project. Um, and the five acre parcel, which was supposed to be phase two, was approved for 44 townhome units at the time, but never constructed. Um, but as part of that project, there is access established to the five acre parcel, which you can see, um, which you can see on the aerial, and that was memorialized in the declaration. So the five acre parcel has access rights through the Renacita project, um, but the five acre parcel has now been combined with the larger 52 acre parcel. 52 acre parcel does not have access rights at this time through Renacita, so it'll have a separate entrance on Cortez which we'll talk about a little bit more in the presentation. And I'm going to hand it over to Rachel. Can I ask the legal? Uh, let's let them finish their okay. presentation. Good morning, commissioners. Um, I am Rachel Layton, and I am a certified planner um, now with 25 years experience, which kind of is scary, and I have been sworn. <laughs> Um, so Scott did a great job of trying to lay out uh, the, some of the history on the site, and it's, it's a, certainly not an easy piece of land to try and come up with a plan. And I have been in front of the commission before with a plan for 24 townhouse units. That was not constructed. The, those approvals have expired. And so now we've looked at uh, this option to have townhouses on the five-acre parcel and then the multifamily uh, in two buildings that are four stories over parking. So I'm going to kind of go through some of the future land use items and the consistency and comprehensive plan uh, information. So we are, um, again, two parcels that are zoned RSS, RES6, future land use category, and also within the airport overlay, coastal planning area, and coastal evacuation area overlays. These overlays require additional review criteria during plan development process and was found to be consistent for this project. The surrounding area transitions from Res 6 to Res 9, Res 16, MUC AC1, and retail office residential, allowing for higher densities and intensities in this area. And again, this is an infill piece of property um, in an area that's been long developed in our community. This has just been a very challenging piece of property to, to come up with a development plan that someone can afford to construct um, and meet all the requirements of the code. So it's been a, it's been a challenge. Um, the project does meet the goals, objectives, and policies of the comprehensive plan. So the zoning request today, we had three different designations on the, the larger of the two parcels. The first parcel has maintained its PDR zoning. The second parcel uh, north of, I'll call the frontage line, um, has always been PDR with no plan attached. And we have NCM and RSF 4.5 along the frontage pieces. So that, those pieces are why we have the rezoning application in front of you today. And uh, within those, we have 3.4 acres of the RSF 4.5 and 1.01 acres of NCM along Cortez Road. And the remainder of the PDR for the larger tract is 52.77 acres. And again, the eastern tract is also already zoned uh, PDR. Um, 
For this project, we have approximately 10.21 acres of uplands available for development within the GDP boundary. We have uh, largely mangrove swamp on this property. It's, it, again, it's a very challenging site. So when we look at development trends in the area, we have residential subdivisions that are single family homes. We have condominiums that are multi-stories in height. Um, and we also have some commercial development coming along this corridor. Um, I noticed that there were three self-storage facilities that have come up. Um, I only worked on one. Um, <laughs> the Dollar General and some shopping centers. So this, again, this is an area where this is infill and this is an area that really could use some additional development. Um, and you will likely see that um, based on the approvals for Peninsula Bay and Lake Flores that were approved several years ago through the general development plan process. And those are mixed use projects. Um, the Lake Flores project is at the southeast corner of Cortez Road in Palma Sola. So it's not very far away from this project. Um, and really everything else has been developed for residential or commercial uses. And um, as we zoom in on the aerial, um, again, it's two parcels of land. We are west of Palmasola Parkway, south of Palmasola Bay, and the western tract is actually technically 4.78 acres, and the eastern parcel is 52.77 acres. <coughs> and it really gave us an opportunity to re-envision how this project could be developed by adding in this larger parcel. So um, while Joel Christian is not here today, I'm going to do my best to try and answer any questions that we have. But we have 47.34 acres of mangrove swamp within the 57.55 acre tract. <coughs> the pond that exists on the site was created in the 1970s. And there are, um, the, the area of open space that has been disturbed was for site construction activities following the approval of PDR 0342 and FSP. 0561 for Gulf View Park, which was the 44 multifamily units that had access through Renesita Phase 1. So uh, here we've got our color site plan. And really, while we have these, this large acreage, really only 20% is usable. Um, and so what we've done is really try and orient this in a way that we have nice traffic flow throughout the project. Um, and um, I'm going to go through the, the standards of, the co of what we have here. So we have 44 townhome units on the eastern parcel and 104 units on the 52.77 acre parcel. And this allows us to transition from the paired villas, which some are three story, some are two story, some are one story. Um, and that kind of transitions down to the single story on the west side of Renesita. And what we're looking at is transitioning from their more intense buildings, their taller buildings, to our taller, to our townhome buildings, which would be three stories, to the four stories over parking for the multifamily. So we're really transitioning away. And again, this is 148 multifamily units because this will be a rental community, we believe. Um, and again, this so this is an average density of 2.5 dwelling units per acre when you take the 148 versus the entire acreage of the site. And I'll get into more specifics on the breakdown um, with that for comp plan in, at the end. Um, utilizing the comprehensive plan, um, we did have to follow a very strict formula. And so uh, the project would have only been allowed 159 and we're proposing 148 multifamily units. We have two shared access points. For the 44 townhome units, they will have access through 43rd Terrace West. And we've proposed a gate between the two projects. Um, this gate is to really separate and allow Renesita to have a separate community as they've always envisioned, but allow for the access through the 44 townhome units to share the access onto 44th. Those residents will also have access to Cortez Road. And at this point, until we have a formal agreement with them, which we've been negotiating now for quite some time, um, the 104 units only has access to Cortez Road. And that's the nature of the specific approval that we have requested. So again, the 44 townhome buildings, seven buildings, three stories, multifamily, four stories over parking. And we have internal access drive of 24 feet. And this allows us to have a separation between Renesita and the townhome units of 117 feet between the structures at those two developments. We have multifamily buildings um, with a maximum height, again, four stories over parking. These buildings are set back 450 feet from the most easterly building in Renesita. Proposed <coughs> building heights do comply with land development code and will be further reviewed for compliance during the final site plan process. 
the townhome buildings will be set back 20 feet from each other. So um, in this next set of slides, we're gonna talk about the roadway buffer, which is 20, 20 feet, sorry, um, and that will be set back after, there's an, after the existing 15 foot utility easement. So we've got almost 35 feet before we have the driveway and 70 feet total to the first building for the setback. And then for the multifamily, it's 152 foot setback to Cortez Road. <coughs> A 15-foot greenbelt buffer is proposed along the western property line. Again, this is a setback of 117 feet between the buildings and the two projects. Project design includes 50-foot wetland buffers along the eastern and northern development limits abutting the mangrove swamps. We have proposed no impacts to the wetlands on this design. So it's been uh, an interesting challenge to make sure that we had no impacts, but with this presentation, we have zero impacts. The open space requirement is 35%. Um, because of the amount of open space um, from the mangrove swamps, we're proposing 92% open space. Um, and this is quite unusual for a project, but again, it's infill and it has unique site characteristics. The amenity center is 1.4 acres in size. Again, we have two specific approvals. We have asked for specific approval um, for sidewalks on both sides of the road to, be, to allow us to, to design something that's a little bit uh, more flexible for this project. And as I'm showing in red here, we're proposing five-foot sidewalks that will connect to Renesita and have a man gate. And then we'll connect back to Cortez Road to the existing sidewalks so that the, the residents will have access to the bus station if they want to use it. There's a bus station right in front of the Renesita project. And we'll also have a nice uh, natural trail through around the stormwater ponds and back to the amenity center. So this really creates a connected sidewalk system and staff and, and school board have been supportive. We've also asked for a parking reduction to, uh, for 10% parking reduction to the required parking calculations. Uh, the commission is very familiar seeing uh, reduction requests for multifamily projects um, as low <coughs> as 1.7. And this one is a request to allow us to use 1.96. Utilities are available for connection. Traffic impact statement has been approved. <coughs> Uh, PM peak hour trips are estimated at 74. FDOT permits will be required. We've initially started those conversations, but will require detailed engineering to be able to complete those negotiations. And so you see a stipulation, several stipulations in the proposed ordinance that address DOT connection. Manatee County Schools have capacity and we have worked closely with staff throughout the process. We have mm -hmm. a supportive staff report and recommendation for approval from Planning Commission. Um, and I, following Planning Commission, I had an opportunity to talk to uh, two of the neighbors that were here um, and then follow up with uh, Mark Castle and Stan Antes to address their access questions because of that ongoing negotiation for access. The proposed project is compatible with development in the area and the project is designed to meet the requirements of land development code. This is a logical progression of residential development in the area. Again, it's an infill project, and we respectfully request the BOCC approve this request today. That concludes my presentation. Our team is here to answer questions that you may have. Thank you, Rachel. The order of the board is Whitmore, Van Austin Ridge, Servia. Commissioner Whitmore. And the chair and I are probably the most familiar with this property. I think even before I was elected, maybe one of Renesita was built. Then the recession hit, and for years there was nothing. And then they started building, and finally um, you see something. But I, I, first of all, if I recall, isn't Renesita, isn't there a gate at the entrance on Cortez Road now? So the correct. person would have to go through that use gate. actors have to have two gates to be able to get in, correct? Yeah. They'd have to go through two gates. Okay. Um, also, from what I understand, it's a total of about 57 acres, and you said 47.3 are wetlands, 92% open space, and uh, maybe one other time I've never heard of that much open <laughs> space. And I understand why, but open space is open space, so I'm glad for that. Now, the legal questions. Um, I, I, when I had my briefing, staff had told me that there's a stipulation that if you can't get access onto Cortez, uh, you won't be able to build 104 units, you'll only be able to build 44. And I just wanted to confirm, <coughs> is that right? I mean, have you gotten the approval for, to access Cortez Road yet? Because I saw that at the, wet, at the east side of the property, it looks like there's an access. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I thought it was an interesting stipulation since every project that's on a state road has to get DOT approval yeah. to have access. It is the only access point that parcel has, so we're not concerned about being approved for access. Well, that's what I was going to say. The only uh, thing that you really have uh, supporting um, you is you have another access through Renacida, and, and so that helps with the project. But if if something happens, you can still build on that lot, but until you get access to Cortez Road, it would be a minimal amount of building uh, structures, correct? We'll have to get approval for access onto Cortez Road in order to build the multifamily. The yes. whole, okay. All right. Thank you. I think that was it. Yep. Thanks. Thank you, Commissioner Whitmore. Uh, if we could pull the site plan up on the monitor again, please. Um, so. My question for you is, and, and before we start, I am very pro property rights, uh, and you know, member of the Realtor Association, strong advocate for property rights. But I do have questions because I'm concerned about the two neighborhoods um, coexisting in harmony. Um, and so, when you use the term rental community, which you used very quickly and slid right past, can you give me a better idea of what a rental community? of what, what is envisioned for a rental community. Are we talking about this is, you're going to have a big amenity center, you know, pool, splash park, and this is going to be short-term rental community? Is that what we're looking at? Because of your, your proximity to the island, that's why I ask. And, it, and again, I'm not saying I'm going to shoot you down over it, but right. we might want to make, you know, try to keep the two separate if that's what we're looking at. Well, I, I don't know whether it's going to be apartments or condos. I, I don't know that at this point. I do think it's intended to be, you know, a resort-style um, amenitized community, kind of like uh, what you see on uh, what's Harbor Harbor Isles on, on Puerto Rico. Yeah, okay. I, do, I do think that that's kind of the vision. That's why you see the large amenity area and sure. stuff like that. Sure. Um, so just to be clear to my fellow board members, we're we're likely looking at an entire community, a resort style community of short term rentals that will have <coughs> access. Which I'm going to look for a little more definition on what exactly is the access between Renacita and, um, and the proposed development. Uh, how are you going to prevent the additional units to the east from utilizing the gate, you know, and utilizing the access through Renacita? Sure. So it would be a key card access on the gate with then only the townhome owners so would have access. Only certain townhomes will have essentially the key card for that gate as well. Well, all, all of the townhomes. All yeah. of the townhomes. Correct. Okay. But the multifamily piece would not But the multifamily to the right will not. That's right. Now, now I do want to say we, we have an agreement in principle with Renacita to allow for shared access through that piece. I and mean, we don't have it finalized yet, but that is something that the applicant has been working with Renacita directly on for No, I, I'm, I'm familiar. The way, the way this was originally drawn up, the HOAs were originally drawn up, the, the, the agreement is there. They have entitled, entitled rights to, to utilize that access point. Um, all I'm trying to do is I'm trying to protect the residents who are year-round residents that are living in Renacita. I'm trying to do what I can to prevent um, their lives from being changed by what's being built next door. That's, that's essentially what my concern is. Um, if you're granted access to Cortez Road um, in good faith, I guess is the only way I can approach this, would would the applicant be willing to limit to the greatest extent possible um, that access point between Renacita? In other words, in encourage and try and make it so that everyone uses the Cortez Road entrance and exit if you're granted that that access point, as opposed to having people go. I'm trying to, if you get the access point on Cortez Road, I'm hoping you'll use that primarily and essentially not go through Renacita. Sure. Because this is a way we can limit the impact on Renacita. Right. I mean, I, I think the reality is particularly from for traffic coming from the east, I mean, they'd have no reason to go by the entrance to the project and sure. go, you know, to Renacita and you turn it back in. So, I mean, I, you know. If, if my memory, now shifting gears a little bit, if my memory jogs me correctly, um, the HOA ties meant that Renacita and this new development would share the amenity center and the pool. Are there access, is there shared access to any of that going on here? And Rachel's smiling. Yeah, that, that is part of at least the agreement in principle is that there will be some 
shared use of the facilities and things like that. That that is part of the what's been discussed. Yes. Okay. That that's all the questions I have for now. Um, Commissioner Serbia. Yes. Thank you. Good presentation, you guys. Um, I'm also very familiar with this property. I worked on this property and the one to the west, um, and it is a unique piece of property. That's a great way to put it. Um, and what I what I really like to point out is that this is where we want to see those higher densities because look at all the preservation that we got. So this is exactly how it should work, right? Um, I wondered, did you have a neighborhood meeting? I know you're working with the neighborhood to the west. Did you have a neighborhood meeting? On we didn't. We didn't have a formal neighborhood meeting. Obviously, like I said, the applicant's been communicating directly with the Renesita. And we don't really, I mean, I guess there is a project across Cortez Road, but the rest of our adjoining property is either the bay or commercial. So that's why we were focused. Okay. There. And and please remind me again, did DOT, are they firm on the access that is to the, the uh, easternmost access? They're, but, they're pleased with that access point? The um, easternmost. Well, I, it's the only access we have. Right. So, okay. I mean, the really the discussion with DOT is what they're going to require as far as potential improvements. Um, we might have like a bump out to allow for a U-turn or something like that. That's really been the discussion with DOT. It's not about are you going to have an access or not have an access. Right. Okay. And um, and there's no plan for a boardwalk or any amenity through the wetland at all at this time. There's not. No. Okay. All right. Good job. Thanks. And it is a just, I forgot to mention earlier, it is a TIF, Southwest TIF project as well. Oh, also thank nice. you. Oh, so they're going to take some of your funds. <laughs> Thanks, Commissioner Whitmore. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Commissioner Servia. Commissioner Satcher. Looking at the, uh, the satellite, <laughs> Commissioner Cruz is telling me I should ask you for a five red lights. Um, he's, he's picking on me. Um, I don't know about this seating arrangement. <laughs> so looking, um, I, I apologize. Okay, so looking to the property to the west, looks like they do have a boardwalk with some type of uh, fishing structure or maybe a home. I'm not sure how far out this satellite is zoomed. Are you familiar with that? just to the west of your red line going out to Palmasol? Yes. That's, that's the other neighborhoods? It is. And you yeah. won't, your residents won't have access to that or they will be able to use that? Uh, I think that's been part of the negotiation as well, but I'm, I'm not positive about that. But either way, it's, there's, no, there's no boardwalk plan on this site. So if we have access for this project, it would be through a shared agreement for that so. boardwalk. You get one shot at access to the water, right? But right. you're not asking for it? Well, they have to, That's too cheap. No. They have to provide the state. I'm just saying, if I, I try to put myself in the no, seat of the, the residents. If I was going to move there, I'd like to be able to walk to the water. But, okay, that's my only question. Okay, thank you, Commissioner Satcher. Um, if there are no other questions for the applicant, which I don't see any, we'll move forward with staff presentation. Marshall? Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Marshall Robinson, and I have been sworn. Um, the applicants did a really good job with all the information they presented to you in my presentation. I'm afraid I'd just be redundant if I ran you through mine. Um, I would talk about a couple of things. We do have the uh, stipulation in the um, <clears throat> staff report that talks about the access, and I just wanted to make it clear that the applicants understand they run the risk of only being left with the vested rights of 44 units having access to 43 terrorists, and they do run the risk of never achieving access to Cortez or getting any agreements worked out. So it could be that this development very well could be approved for all the reasons stated in the staff report. It's a suitable request. It is infill development. We didn't have any compatibility issues. So with having said all that, we could <clears throat> potentially see this GDP with entitlements of 148 units, but the realization is because of access and other jurisdictional decision makers, um, they might only be left with the 44. So I just wanted to make sure that we put that out there that everybody understood that. 
Other than that, they meet the open space. Obviously, as discussed, they're in the CHH, the CPA, <clears throat> which requires the additional open space requirements. Um, the code did implement um, some transfer of density credits uh, to incentivize them to take some of the units they would otherwise be able to develop out of those um, wetlands and put them with their uplands to get some density out of it. And I think it's a, a good location for that. So I'd be happy to answer any questions if anybody has any. Thank you, Marshall. Commissioner Satcher has a question. And they're impacting how many, uh, how much wetlands and mangroves right now? Um, I'd have this to plan. look. Commissioner. Gary, do you know what the number is? Yeah, yeah, okay, that's what I was thinking. There's no wetland impact. Zero. Zero acres of wetland impact. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Satcher. Um, I'm going to move forward with public comment then. And I do have some cards for public comment. Mark Hazel. So the order of my cards are Hazel, Bartlett, Shepard, and Peter something with a K. So when you come forward, please state your name, your county of residence, and keep your comments focused on the current agenda item. Uh, Mark Hazel, I've been sworn. I live in Manatee County in the Villas Arena Cita. Um, we, I'm going to expand on the comments I made on January 13th, and that we think that there might be an um, issue with compliance with the second entrance because according to your bylaws, if you're building a development over 100 homes, you need two points of ingress, egress. The existing one now has two points of, or has a, it, the existing one now has both right in, right out, left in, left out, so runs at 100% capacity utilization potential. But the one that's being proposed is only right in, right out. So at most, it could be 50% capacity so rather than having the two required, we believe that you might only have one and a half required. Now we believe there's a very easy solution and that is either to move that eastern entrance or the proposed entrance about 50 yards to the east, to the end of the median on, in the center of Cortez Road and that will allow left in, left out, right in, right out. Or move the median that same distance to allow the same left in, left out problem solved. And without that, we believe that the U-turns the proposed present a danger over left in, left out, because it takes much less time to make a left in turn than it does to make a U-turn. And I did the U-turn in both directions, and while I made it in my small SUV, I crossed both lanes and into the bicycle lane and came within about two feet of the curb. If I was driving an F-150 or any large pickup truck, truck, guaranteed I would have been up on the curb. So a bump out for sure will help, but with a lot of seniors and 50 mile an hour traffic, it's not necessarily the safest solution. And anyway, I'll end it there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Hazel. Um, Catherine Bartlett, followed by Mr. Shepard. Name, county of residence, and please stay on the subject at hand. Catherine Bartlett, I have been sworn. I recently became a resident of Manatee County. I am uh, proudly retired from the state of New York as a retired judge, and I moved here, and I own a home in Rena Cita. I also happen to be the president of the HOA, which is known as Gulf View HOA, but it's the villas of Rena Cita. We had a homeowner meeting on Monday night. I have understood that in the packet is a letter that I signed as president offering support. But that was because we were in negotiations to reach an agreement. And as the attorney for the applicant said, it's ongoing, but I wish to withdraw that letter because the negotiations seem to have broken down and for a few reasons. And the issue really is the traffic. Um, and it's interesting to me that discussions with FDOT have only begun. I would think 148 homes would warrant a discussion with FDOT up front. And we recently learned of information that has caused me to withdraw that letter. And what in reality is happening is that if we have an agreement, 
and everyone has access to our gate. If you, you know, I know most of you are familiar with the area. At least 70% of the cars are going to be making a left-hand turn. Doctors, malls, shopping, etc. Government buildings. So, if there's only one left turn, one left egress and, and ingress from that whole complex, it will be through our gate. And that is not what we envisioned, that's not what we were told. Um, so you can imagine, we were quite astounded to learn, and if Cortez Bridge goes under construction and it shuts down, then I would assume, therefore, 100% of all vehicles will be making a left turn. And a U-turn on Cortez and a U-turn lane, I understood, I heard the last meeting, the last agenda item, FDOT is encouraging U-turn lanes on Cortez. That's, to me, and I don't know anything about traffic in Manatee County, although I'm learning it's quite busy, is suicide. So in reality, I think you're going to have everyone using our left turn gate. And that is not what we were told for 148 units. Secondly, we were told that this multifamily were condominiums and townhouses <coughs> being sold in the range of 350 to 450. Now we're hearing that they're short-term rentals for beach traffic. I assume that's why they're here. And if the Cortez Bridge is closed, <coughs> which I understand may happen in 2025, I understand that's still up in the air, again, 100% of the traffic will be turning left. Left ingress and left egress is only available now, as I understand the plan. Is my time up? Sorry. It is. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. All right. Thank you. Harold Shepard is next. And then Peter, who lives on, well, I won't say that, but we'll say Peter, is next. I think she should have known she could have spoke longer. She's representing the OSHA, HOA. No. So, sir, please state your name, county of residence. Uh, stay on topic and you have three minutes. Yeah, my name is Harold Shepard. I'm a resident of Renesita. I'm a uh, Manatee County uh, resident. And uh, I'm here to speak about what Catherine and Mark were talking about. Were you sworn, oh, I was sworn, yes. Um, there's a real problem with the traffic there <laughs> because Crown has not gotten approval to... to uh, have a, a way to turn left out of their second exit. If they turn right, <coughs> the first place they will make a U-turn will be in front of Renesita and in front of Gulf Shores. And it's going to cause a queue of cars trying to get out of both areas and make U-turns. I don't know how construction traffic is going to handle that itself. I mean. I don't know where they're going to ever turn around. The other thing is Cortez Road, Mark said 50 miles an hour. That's an understatement. There are cars that are going 70 miles an hour on Cortez Road. <coughs> it's going to create the perfect storm. It's going to be maybe one of the most dangerous points on Cortez Road if there's not a way for their cars to turn left to get out of their community. And then, I, I don't know, the bombshell about being rental units was just that. Our homeowners were just flabbergasted that this is what it turned out to be. So I don't know what school, school buses are going to do. You know, when they come, come in, how are they going to get out? It's a dangerous situation. And I think Crown needs to come up with their own solution that will solve the problem. Thank you. All right, thank you, sir. Is Peter here? He is. Sir, please state, please. So, Madam Clerk, we'll need to swear him in. And then I would just say, please state your name, county of residence. You have three minutes to stay on topic. Do you, uh, do you swear and affirm that the factual statements and factual representations which are about <coughs> to present to the board will be truthful and accurate? I do. Thank you. <clears throat> Hello, my name is Peter Chrysler, and I'm a lifelong resident of Manatee County, and I've lived uh, behind Paradise Bay, which is you know a mile out and on the Bayside uh, since 1995. Um, what was that? Please state that you were sworn. I was sworn. Um, so, anyway, 
you know, in the big picture, I don't know how, you know, the, the mangroves, you know, it's a large area of mangroves. I don't know how that stuff applies to density. I'm not a developer, but it seems like when you drive by Renesina, that looks like an acceptable development. I think that sort of density at 40 some units makes sense. And I think a developer should be able to make, you know, a good amount of money building a resident, you know, a, a neighborhood like that. But 48 sounds like a lot of density. When I leave here in a few minutes and drive home, it's a nice day and beach traffic will be backed up probably to Paradise Bay where I am. Sometimes it backs up to Palmasola. And, you know, there's probably a thousand acres between Elk and Quistador, 53rd, 75th. It's all land all the way out to Palmasola. And if every developer comes and presses the boundary, I mean, you created a future land use code for a reason. And if you hold them to that, and Maybe add some roads someday. The traffic won't get insane, but you know you can turn it into Lower Manhattan if you let everybody come and do this. And I realize your parcel is small and complicated, but they could build like Renesita and still do perfectly well. You know, making money on their development. So please be uh, please be good stewards and hold them to the density in the future land use code. Thanks so much. Thank you, sir. I don't have any more cards, but I will open this up to anyone in the audience who would like to come forward. Is there anyone here who would like to come forward and speak on this agenda item? Not seeing anyone, I'm going to close public comment. And I will ask staff if they would like to make any additional comments before we move on. No additional comments from staff. Would the applicant like to make any additional comments? Just a couple. Um, and again, Scott Rudisell for the record. Um, wanna, I want to touch on some of the comments from the neighbors. We at this time don't have an agreement with the neighbors to utilize their access point for all the units in the project. So that is only going to happen if they agree to it. And, and I don't, th based on what I'm hearing, I don't think that's going to happen unless we, we address some of their concerns. So um, without them agreeing to it, we would only have access to the townhome units to be connected to their project. The multifamily units would would have access on Cortez Road. So um, the other thing I want to note, there was a lot of comments about rental units. That has not been decided. Um, they are, like I said, it's proposed to be a resort style community. But if you look at like Harbor Isles, you know, those aren't those aren't rental units. There's a lot of people that live in there. So um, I that got that got put out there as that's what's happening and that that is not that is not what is being proposed it's also not something that the county regulates um, you know any multifamily single family duplex <coughs> residential unit in the county could be converted to a vacation rental at any time unless it has private restrictions on it so i hope that addresses the comments but i'm happy to answer any questions thank you mr rudisell the order of the board is Cruz Whitmore Servia, Commissioner Cruz. And maybe I missed this earlier, so so I apologize. And this is more for the the applicant. I thought we were going to applicant questions, but um, where do we stand in terms of <coughs> making a real left turn out here? Because I mean, this is a real problem. I mean, even if you just look at the townhomes, because you have no choice but to go through this other neighborhood. I'm not a huge inner neighborhood type fan in the first place but that, that's your only option to make a left turn out of this place and let's be honest unless you're going to the beach you're making a left turn out of this place that that's that's where everything is you're, you're <laughs> at the, the far edge of town outside of going to the beach so it, it, it's going to be predominantly left and you've got to use this and to their point that's gonna be a lot of cars all tied up right there and that's going to cause a problem with that intersection so has there been talk about just you know how you're intending to handle this even if it is just the townhomes and you don't have access to Cortez and if you do have access to Cortez and you build the rest of them has there been talk of how that's going to be handled well I'll tell you the initial discussions with DOT are they're not granting a, a left in to the project or a left out it's it will be for the for the access point that is proposed it will be a right in right out um, and I mean, you know, that's just that that is what it is and it really is not that unusual on a, you know, on a limited access facility like that. Um, so but what, what's your proposal? What's the proposal on how people are going to head east? I mean, you literally you're going to have to turn right out of there and then make a U turn, which is just going to jam that up, not just for, for these people, but man, the Coral Boulevard on the other side, there's a lot of <laughs> that's going to tie up that whole intersection. We had that where I live in Greyhawk because Eagle Trace, I think it is. 
they could only make a, a, a turn out east. And as soon as they turned out east, if they wanted to go west, they had to go to 117 and make a U-turn. And that just destroyed that entire intersection because all we had was people making U-turns all over the place while they tried to pull out. I mean, that's just a, a hornet's nest. Th th there's no possibility of making a left turn out of this place without having to hit that intersection or go through their neighborhood? I'll let, I'll let Michael talk about right. what. This is going bad. Hi, uh, Michael Yates with Palm Traffic, and I have been sworn. Uh, yeah, so we've actually had a lot of conversations with DOT on many different options and trying to figure out a solution. Um, and so uh, let me walk through a little bit of the traffic issues and then kind of explain where DOT is, what the position is, and the solutions that DOT has agreed to, at least in concept to this point. Um, if, if it's okay, I, I'm gonna put something on the overhead so everyone can see it. So what this is, is the existing uh, traffic adjusted to peak season. So you can see what the predominant movement is coming out. So you get, this is the um, 92nd lane, uh, Renesita driveway here. So you only have six cars making a left out in the morning and four in the afternoon. And then you have uh, on the neighborhood to the south, again, the predominant movement is to and from the east. You have 56 and 43. And so it's a fairly light volume from a, when you talk about an intersection volume, uh, and that is the volume over the course of an hour. So about one car every minute. Um, and so I can walk through this site plan and point to things a little bit. Um, so we did discuss with DOT, there is an existing median opening, uh, existing median that is along Cortez that runs along this entire section here. It is a two-way left turn lane to the west. Uh, but in this section, it is an existing concrete median out there in Cortez. And so the discussions we've had, we asked is, could we remove the median? The answer was no. Could we move the driveway further to our east and provide a left turn lane and have our direct access over there with a directional left in, left out? No. <laughs> and so what DOT was agreeable to doing was to provide a U-turn lane on Cortez over in this range to allow for U-turns. And we acknowledge that what the residents have said is that making a U-turn on the four lane divided is a tough thing to do given the existing geometry out there in a larger vehicle. And so what we would need to do is a little bulb out that allowed for the U-turn. So a space for the vehicle to go extend beyond the four lanes to complete that U-turn movement. And so that would be over in this range. As part of that, we would also need to extend this westbound left that is out there today and extend that back here to make sure that there is ample storage and deceleration. So we would not only meet the DOT standards for storage length, and deceleration length. And so both of those could be accomplished in that median, and that is where we kind of left it with DOT through those reviews. Uh, they have conceptually agreed to those improvements. That is what they have want as far as geometry. Again, the reason it has not been finalized is we've been waiting through the process of negotiation to whether there would be full cross access or is it just the partial cross access. Uh, I hope that it doesn't, I'm sure, make you happy, but that is the answer. That is the discussions we've had and we've gone through, asked DOT for these left in, left outs, <coughs> requested it, went all the way up through their management staff and were denied. Yeah, I mean, you could only do what DOT will let you. I, I'm not a I, I, honestly, that U-turn option doesn't do me any favors because I'm referring more towards the issue of heading east from here, getting out. But all that U-turn does is allow people from the beach to make a U-turn and come into the separate entrance instead of using their entrance. That's that, that's I think. And it and it would be a reverse component of my concern. It would be a reverse U-turn coming out. So you would make the right out from the driveway, 
come to this intersection, then make a U-turn to go back east rather than making a left out. Fine. So if you're leaving the development. Okay, I'm with you so far. Go ahead. You would make the right out here. Uh huh. You would come into this left turn lane that we're extending and make the U-turn movement here. Oh, no, I'm well aware you can do that. That's a... And so well, the turn lane would I'm be a sufficient length to allow the cars to queue, Absolutely. allow the vehicles to make the U-turn. DOT views that as the safest maneuver Seriously? on the highway. Yes. Well, that's a statement of by itself. <laughs> <laughs> so, can we get a roundabout? Okay, thank you, Commissioner Cruz. All right. Commissioner, Commissioner Whitmore, you're next. Did you, I'm sorry, do you have anything? Yeah. Okay, Commissioner uh, Whitmore. Location is everything. I've been involved, I voted for Renesita, and I'm glad you all enjoy it, because I've taken heat when it was getting approved also. So I'm glad you all enjoy it. And I'm a five-decade uh, uh, resident of Anna Maria Island. So needless to say, I, I go both Cortez Road and Manatee Avenue to get out to the island. So I understand what you're saying. And I know somebody wrote three or 400,000 for those condos. Are you kidding me? Harbor Isles is seven to six to nine hundred thousand now. Its location is everything. So I, I just had to bring that up because I don't think if you're going to do three or four hundred thousand, they'll be sold before you even build them. So you know, I have a feeling the market's going to raise the prices up. Uh, the second means of a access, I, a citizen said that they can't build those additional units unless they get Cortez Road. Am I correct? Am I supposed to ask the applicant? Is it not true? That's why I brought this up at the beginning of the meeting. Unless you get that Cortez Road access, you can't do the rent with the other side of the project, correct? Correct. The multifamily so, can't be built. So what we're arguing about is something that legally has been allowed since Renesita was built to allow that access, right? I guess you were going to sell it at once and you've worked on the project. So I guess I have to ask the attorney, is that correct? You've been a always able to use that second means of access. For the for the smaller parcel. For Renesita, correct. Okay. Yes. Now, who in their right mind, if they do get an access to Cortez Road, who wants to go through two gates to get to you, go through Renesita? I would be going right to Cortez Road. I mean, I mean, really, you'd have to use your little blipper to get through two gates, and so. And I've noticed that they have put up a, a gate in the last year or so. So I'm glad of that. Traffic issue. Anna Maria Island, I can't even begin to say that. I, the traffic's backed up past 75th Street West, and I'm on Manatee Avenue, it's to 59th and 43rd Street West. So uh, that is not a cause of this one project. That's because everybody in the world wants to visit the island, unfortunately, and we do live in paradise. Um, legal access, I, uh, somebody mentioned the bridge is gonna be closed down to build. No, it's not, we can all guarantee that. Um, Commissioner Boz on the MPO. We have two others on the MPO. That bridge will be, be built alongside the current one, and that's that will never be closed down. That was well, never. Be It'll be simultaneously. So I, I'd heard that it was going to be shut down when we're building it. So that's not going to be a problem. And then, as long as I've lived here, mm -hmm. I had to Google Earth it right now. Pomasola has a light, and it's how far away is Pomasola Boulevard to this project? Do you even know? Because I'm thinking 60, 70 miles an hour, I mean, maybe at 11 at night people do it, but I mean, you have to stop at that light if it's, and then you're not going to be going, I mean, sure, if the light's green and there's nobody coming around probably, but there's a light not too far from this project. Am I correct? Yes, it's very close how, to these. How, it's, it's not very far, but I couldn't Google map or, uh, it. Miles. So, two, two, 800 oh. feet. 800 feet. So if the lights stop, you're not going to be going 60 or 70 miles. Well, some idiots will. Um, but anyway, um, I understand where you're all coming from. If they can't get the state, somebody's laughing at me. Um, if they can't get the state to give that access to Cortez Road, it's not going to happen. You're going to get those legal, and my staff is uh, nodding in agreement. You will get the 44, whether you like them or not, because that is their right from previous arrangements from the people that owned your project. So I live there, we got a great quality of life. You got 92% open space and I guess you guys will be able to use that. Uh, you'll be able to go to the pool and the rec room if you guys agree. Now if you're gonna drop your agreement, you may wanna think twice because you may wanna uh, use those amenities because I don't think you have any. I, I, I've driven in there before the gates came up and all you have is those beautiful townhomes which I absolutely love. 
uh, and I'm sure they're not going for three or four hundred thousand dollars. <laughs> so uh, location is everything. You are not going to get, I think, and I, this is just an opinion because this is a legal proceeding. If they sell these for three or four hundred, that's almost affordable housing in Manatee County now. So that's anyway, that's all I got to say. I just had to say that somebody that lives there and that voted for your subdivision, which is absolutely beautiful, I just wanted to see, you know, give you guys the realities of what I see as a resident around that area. Thanks. Thank you, Commissioner Whitmore. Commissioner Servia. Thank you. Um, great discussion. And I have a question about the school bus stop. Uh, one of the residents brought that up. And I, yeah. I see the comments from the school district say that uh, I think there'll be a bus stop at the entrance to 92nd and Cortez, which is on the Gulf View Estates side. Is that correct? Give me just one second. Uh, there's an existing county bus st st stop at 92nd in front of Renacita on the west side of the entrance. But I need okay. to uh, look at the school board report real quick. Okay, all right, sure. Um, and so I, I bring that up because it was brought up by a citizen and I think that that has been considered is what I'm understanding. Um, and then, you know, we hear a lot about short-term rentals mm -hmm. and uh, in neighborhoods. Now, Neighborhoods that have HOAs do have some ability to limit that, although the state of Florida has said that they are allowed. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, those are, we can't interfere between what, what people want to do with their home, but homeowner associations can. For example, <clears throat> where I live, there's a requirement in the documents that if you buy a home there, you have to live there for two years before you can rent it. And so those are some of the things that they do to curb those short-term rental communities. But there isn't anything that the county gets involved in. And as we sit up here and think about land use decisions, we can't consider, even if they're rental or to be sold fee simple, that's just not a matter that we consider when looking at the criteria for this type of rezone. So I just wanted to explain that to the people who have those concerns. Um, any any news on the school bus stop? Yes. So the school report does say, and I, I'm going to have to assume that it's because that existing but county transit stop is there. Um, but they say uh, the development is not located in, within two-mile walking of an existing middle and high school. School district intends to utilize Cortez Road and 92nd as student pickup and drop-off for the development. Applicant may want to work with local government to establish no parking ordinance in the entrance drive due to the trend of vehicles parking in the area for the bus stops. And we see that, that similar comment on every project that we have right now. And also, if there's students with special needs, They'll be able, the bus will have to come into the development to pick up those students. Um, I also wanted to mention uh, it's the development is located within two mile walking radius of Seabreeze Elementary, so the elementary school students do not qualify for busing. So it would be middle and high school students that would be at the bus stop, um, dependent on you know how many families we have moving into that area. And so they're projecting for the number of dwelling units that there would be a total of 33 students. Okay. So it's not a it's not an overwhelming number of students that they're anticipating based on the multifamily and townhouse numbers that they used in their formula. And again, we have the sidewalks uh, with a connected network in the project to ensure that through both access points that there's pedestrian connectivity back to Cortez Road and to that bus stop. And the roads in, in Gulfview Estates or whatever the name of the project is, is are they, those are public roads. Is that correct, or are they private? They are private, they are and private. there is language in their HOA documents to allow for the access to the eastern parcel, which is the 44-unit parcel. Okay. So then if they wanted to put up a no parking sign for the, the school bus issue, they would have a right to just do that. Absolutely. They wouldn't have to come through this board to ask correct. for permission. Correct. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you, Commissioner Servia. I'll just make a sort of a final statement here and, and say that uh, this is infill. This is a, a, a good location for infill, and it's exactly what infill should be. Um, I will say that uh, Ms. Layton and, uh, and Scott have certainly earned their money on this property because it's, it's sort of like an onion. You know, when you look, uh, Mr. Rudisil, sorry, when you, when you look at it, 
it looks like this perfect little rectangle of infill property, but it's like an onion. And as you just you just keep peeling back layers on this property, it's it's actually very complex and very complicated. Um, and I think the only it seems like the only way to to make money on this thing is for it to end up being a short term rental resort style situation. Um, I know that the, the property owner has not committed to that yet, but uh, you're not going to pull the wool over my eyes. I, I see that is exactly where this is going. And my concern is that if you are intending to to go to the east, um, you know, you ultimately have to go in through Renesita. If and when you come home, you don't, you know, if you get the second piece of, uh, you know, the second access. Uh, but if you're going west, you know, you may not have to go through Renesita, but when you come home, you will. So either way, I see almost 100% of the trips going through Renesita, and I can't in good conscience uh, approve this knowing that the dramatic impact it's going to have on the residents in Renesita. Uh, I now have two commissioners on the board, Commissioner Cruz and Satcher, and I have Servia following them. So we will start with Commissioner Cruz. I, I, I hate when people echo things, but just to make sure on the record, I 100% agree with everything you just said. You know, everything about this project I, I loved when I read through it. I, I love the infill location. I don't care if it's rental or not. To everyone's point, we're not allowed to take that into consideration. You know, that's Florida statute. People can do with their properties what they want to do with them. You know, I, I think you know, I, I would move to this, this project. Uh, God willing, one day I will be in a condo out by the beach. But you know, my, my issue is just this, this ingress egress and in fact getting the the access to cortez is the worst case scenario for everybody because now you're just going to add more and people are still going to cut through the down 90 second because you're still stuck in the same situation but now with four times as many homes you're dealing with here you know the, the self-storage facility has better ingress egress than than all of these residential units are going to have you know if you came to me and said we're moving the median and now you can make a left i'm a hundred percent on board you even came to me and said DOT said, you know, promised to put a roundabout at 92nd and Cortez. I'm on board. Right now, I, I just, I'm just afraid this is going to, you're going to get the access. It's going to allow all the additional units, which are going to be short-term rental or otherwise, I don't care. And now you have a lot of units here, and we're going to look back in a couple of years when this gets built and this gets sold out. And to Commissioner Wimmer's point, this is going to be sold out almost instantly. So this is going to be an immediate full project. This is just going to, that intersection is going to be a hornet's nest. It, it, it's just going to be U-turns one way and right turns and left turns and people coming from the north and south. I, I've seen it. It's a problem. And once it becomes a problem, now you have to start doing the construction to fix it. And it just makes it worse of a problem until it gets fixed, just like we were dealing with on 64. I, I can't get on board with this until there's some assurance that there's going to be real ingress egress for this many units without cutting through somebody else's project endlessly, couple with bus stops, couple with it, it's, it, it's, it's just a mess. Everything about it's great. I know you have nothing to do with this. I know you're working very, very hard with FDOT to fix this, but until it's fixed or some insurance being fixed, I, I, I just can't get on board with it because of that one issue. Thank you, Commissioner Cruz. The order of the board is now Satcher, Servia, Whitmore, and Ms. Shank. Commissioner Satcher. It's me and Reggie. He is not on the board. <laughs> yeah. Commissioner Satcher. So I have two things to say. First of all, just to the commissioners moving forward, I always try to uh, put our best practices. Um, commissioners moving forward, I think if it looks like it might be a close vote, we need to start letting people know where we stand um, so that people can act accordingly. I don't want to have disagreements up here in front of God and everybody and television if it's not a uh, if it's if it's not necessary, so I, I I work with you. I lunch with all you guys. So I don't look forward to making my best and strongest, or or even if they're weak. But I don't enjoy disagreeing. So I just feel like I wish people were would let you know let us know where they stand. And maybe that's just my habit. I'm counting votes generally, and um, so but but I'll just say this. I literally, on the previous project, brought the exact same, changed the names, mm -hmm. changed the players uh, to protect the innocent, but the exact same issue on an East County, you got 301 versus Cortez, both two very fast-moving roads. You got 64 that I talked about in Lakewood Ranch, both two busy <laughs> roads. 
You have the exact same issue, except that the people pulling out of Publix, which is going to, or whatever ends up being at that spot, are going to be similar in number to uh, people pulling out of this development. I would think a lot more people are probably pulling out of a Publix. And I was dismissed. I was told that I was wrong. The, I was told that I didn't understand the intersection that I literally have gone to hundreds of times um, and that it was no big deal. And I said I just wanted staff to take note of it in the future so we could avoid this if possible moving forward. And then I voted 7-0 for that project. So for us to vote against this for the exact same reason to me says, if you live west, you know, then we're going to do whatever. But if you live east, whether, you're, whether it's busy for you or not, whether there's traffic bearing down on you or not, no big deal. We should be consistent. We should have principles. Either this is worth turning down a project for and sending somebody back to the drawing board, or it's not. And if it wasn't worth it last vote, then it's not worth it this vote. If it was worth it last vote, then it is ver 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 worth it this vote. So, um, and those are the comments I didn't want to have to say, but I don't know where the votes are, so I, I think I should get those facts out there. Um, and I absolutely, we could go into a long conversation, but I promise you, I understand the intersections at Publix at 64 and Lakewood Ranch Boulevard, and then 301 and Fort Hammer. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Satcher. Uh, Commissioner Servia. Thank you very much. Okay. So here's where I stand. <laughs> I, I, since, since you asked, Commissioner Satcher, and, uh, and I don't have lunch with others because I don't want any pressure. So, you know me. I, I stay in my own lane. Um, okay, so I have a, qu a couple questions, and maybe the traffic engineer or the planner could just kind of stand up. Mr. Chair, and I, excuse me. I want to be careful on this quasi process. If we're going to allow testimony during deliberation, oh. we have to open the public hearing up so everyone can okay. speak. Yeah, we're not going to okay. hear from the applicant. Okay, so I won't ask any questions then. I'll just tell you we're what I understand. So what I understand, uh, being a land use planner for more than 30 years and now a county commissioner going on my fourth year, is that I have encountered so many people in my life that believe that they understand traffic better than the traffic engineers. I myself am guilty of that sometimes. But I'm somebody who relies on the professionals. I just do. Because when you're a traffic engineer, you understand all of the movements and all of the nuances to, to these developments. We can only imagine, but they, they have an understanding and they have an education in it and they have certifications in it and it's all they do every day. So DOT is is going to allow what they believe is safe and appropriate, period. <laughs> and no matter how we all feel about it, I think that that's secondary. Um, I'm not a traffic engineer. I rely on the traffic engineers. Um, this, the same is true for, um, for zoning and for land use, you know. Um, you know, we talk a lot of, up here about how we don't like sprawl, how we don't want to impact the lands that are way out east, and we, there's controversy about mute, moving the FDAB line. Well, this is how you, how you get there and preserve that land, is by approving density that is in the urbanized area. So that's why I like this. I like this project. Um, we've heard it's consistent with our comprehensive plan. It's consistent with our land development code. Um, and we have to assume that they are not going to work out an access with the development to the west. But you know what? It will still work according to all of the rules and laws on the books. And that's what I'm standing on. So I'm going to support this project. Thank you, Commissioner Servia. Order of the board is Shank. Whitmore Baugh. Ms. Shank, would you like to make a statement? I'll go last. Uh, yes, please. I just want to point out, we have a bit of a sticky wicket here. Sticky wicket. <laughs> In that. <laughs> In that. That's a legal term. <laughs> I, I, I requested staff, you've got two alternative motions here that are approval. One is approval of the whole enchilada, the whole project. The second motion is approval of parcel one and denial of parcel two. And I, I just have to caution the board, no, we, we have a unique situation here in that we have a court order saying that they have vested rights to the parcel one, 
the 44 units, or however many units is, at 12 units per acre and three floors over parking and that right of access they discussed. So the board has to approve parcel one or in violation of a court order, we have to go through contempt proceedings again. So I, if, if it goes that someone wants to move to only approve parcel one, I'll have to read the motion because there'll have to be con deliberation on parcel two, it'll have to be continued to a future land use meeting because we have to do written fines for denial on parcel two and also parcel one, the ordinance has to be rewritten again too and we have to keep everything open. So I'm just saying, you know, it's, it's a little bit messy. Right. And I did inquire through the staff, Mr. Robinson, if the applicant would do options set up for us. You know, option one was just, they didn't want to. They want to tie everything together. Mm -hmm. It's in their legal interest to do so, obviously. So when we have to bifurcate it on the record, it gets a little messy. So I'm just questioning that if, you, if you're inclined to only approve parcel one, that may be the motion at the appropriate time. Thank you, Ms. Shank. So when a commissioner does go to take action on the item and make a motion, please defer to Ms. Shank to read your motion. Just indicate to her what it is you're trying to achieve. The order of the board is Whitmore, Boss Satcher. We are coming up on the 11 o'clock hour, so I'll continue through the board, but just make it known that the chair is entertaining motions. Commissioner Whitmore. Um, Commissioner Cruz had brought up he's not going to uh, support the motion because of that reason about turning out right and doing the U-turn. I travel Cortez Road to do U-turns all the time and I haven't had a problem, knock on wood. That can't be a reason not to approve this project because, well, actually what Ms. Shank just said, that those 44 units are approved. I mean, they, they have that access to that property. And I'm going to support the whole project because if they can't work with FDOT and get it, the other part goes away. So, Satcher, you and I are on the same page for let's do a number one. Make a motion. I mean, U turns all over the county. I can't, I don't think, make a motion yet. I'm, not, I'm going to do it for the whole I, thing. I am entertaining. Ball is still on the board, but I am entertaining motions. I'll, I'll ask. Um, Ms. Shank to make a, a motion to include both parcels because they can't build the second parcel without Cortez access. Second. Well, we're going to have uh, Ms. And Shank my read staff the... staff member is shaking his head. I'm, I am... I'm going to have Ms. Shank read uh, okay. the motion and then you can make the motion to approve okay. and Satcher can second it. Okay. It would just be the alternative motion number one for approval of both parcels one and two as stated in the staff report. Well, that was easy. Yes. I make that motion. I'll second it. So we have a motion by Commissioner Whitmore and a second by Commissioner Satcher. And Commissioner Baugh, you are next on the board. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I have sit here and not spoken <laughs> on this issue at all. I think it's just Commissioner Bellamy and myself. So I've sit here and heard from all of you. And <clears throat> I, uh, I feel like that I, I was going along with the, with the chairman. This is great infill. It is. <coughs> But at the same time, then I heard other comments. You know, this board, um, we're put on this board by the citizens of this county. We represent them. It sometimes that means that we don't necessarily go by the law as is written because we have uh, responsibility to the citizens. And I think sometimes we tend to forget that. Uh, I've heard a lot of comments about out east. This is not out east. There's a big difference between this area and Lakewood Ranch, uh, particularly Lakewood Ranch Boulevard in 64. <clears throat> um, and it is true, and Commissioner Servia brought this up, you know, it is true. Uh, you know, that area doesn't want to be uh, just like Cortez Road. And the reason is, you know, a lot of it's traffic and, and so forth. And we're trying to be smart on what we do. And you see a lot of roundabouts that are being put on 64 uh, by DOT. And I wish that I had heard something about I was waiting for the applicant or somebody, you know, I really would love to see a roundabout at this intersection for this project. But at any rate, we're past that. Um, I have every intention of supporting this project um, because and only because I know that right now they can build the 44 units, but they're going to have a hard time doing anything else. I do believe that. So uh, to me, it's, it's uh, what we see today is not what it will be if 
they are able to build the rest of the units. And that's their salvation as far as I'm concerned today. So, um, you know, that, that's it. I just feel like that, you know, sometimes we, we can't always have a project come before us that we like everything about it. We're not going to. Um, and this is one of them. Um, so because of the 44 units that we know they can build, uh, I will support this. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, Baugh, I have Cruz and Bellamy on the board. Bellamy has not spoken yet, so I am going to go to Bellamy first. So it'll be Bellamy, Cruz, and Commissioners. It is now 11 o'clock, and the Chair is entertaining motions to call the question. Commissioner Bellamy. <laughs> I thought we were done <laughs> Commissioner Bellamy. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I have, I have a couple of things that I, that I want to say. It almost seems like because I, I sit here and I get all the information before I communicate that that's a problem. And I don't, um, I don't know the way I was raised. You, you, you listen first, and then you communicate, and things like that. But not, not a shot at anybody. I'm not up here counting votes or anything like that. I'm, I'm up here trying to be the best Reggie I can be. So with that, I have to learn as much information as I can. And it's kind of hard to learn if, if you're talking while somebody else is talking. It's just, just me. And that's been said a couple of times. So I'm, I'll, I'll just put that there and let that park right there. But the, the reality on how I'm looking at this is you got a lot of scenarios out there, and the access points are very much concerned um, with, with, with the residents. And, and I'm concerned about that um, at, as well. And we got approval options um, based on what's already been presented. We, we know for a fact that one part of it can possibly be done. And, and now you have the what if scenarios based on um, the negotiations with the HOA, and, and I hope, and, and, and this is just me, and I'm sure most of the people know me by now, I hope that negotiation has not been stopped to stop the project. You, you, you understand what I'm saying? And I don't, I don't, I don't know, but that's just not, and, and unfortunately in today's society, in our country, you know, we, we have a lot of, you know, actions like that where we're going to do this so you can't do that instead of finding a way to come together and put things in motion. And if I am wrong, um, retired, Your Honor. I apologize, but I hope that's I hope that's not um, the, the issue. My, my my position is always to be to, to to move forward and find ways to get things done to make a positive the positive impact. And I think this is a good project, and I think it's positive. And like one of the colleagues said, everything is aligned is aligned here um, legally. You got some challenges for that second part. Mm -hmm. And I wish you the best of luck. And unfortunately, we're in, we're in February. This is not the holiday season, so you obviously got your work cut out for you. I can't say Merry Christmas to you, but I would not be the one. I would not be the one to vote against, you know, with this because of those challenges. Those are not my challenges. Those are your challenges, right? And and I think based on the access and the issues and the opportunities and everything like that, they're realistic. They're they're they're, they're realistic, and it, it's an opportunity. I will be supporting it. I will be supported because the way the way I look at it, you know, the first part's there and the second part, y'all got the legal mind there. That guy that guy's very talented. And he'll find he he'll find a way to make sure you get it done. And I expect for them to take and communicate with the homeowners association so everybody can get on the same page. Let, let, listen, all us live here. All us live here. Let's do our part to make sure it goes in the right direction. And I'm sure that they'll go back to the table at the point in time and communicate. Um, with the homeowners association, and that that will be my position. Me to move, to support it, to move forward, and for everybody to get on the same page. Thank you, Commissioner Bellamy. The final commissioner on the board is Commissioner Cruz. I wasn't. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. I wouldn't do that to you, George. Oh, I'm sorry. Because I was going to make a motion to call the question. Uh, okay. <laughs> no, all, all I was all I was going to say was what we keep hearing about how one parcel has to be approved, so therefore. The motion is the motion. That's not true. As, as the That's county true. attorney said, we can make a motion just for one parcel. So to say, well, one parcel is mandatory effectively, so therefore, well, let's just throw it all in there. And then to say that the second part we're comfortable with because it only comes into play if they get the ingress egress off of Cortez, but we all know from most of our conversations that, in, that ingress egress is not a right left turn. It, it's just going the one direction, which is the problem. Last year, most of us, because it was declined, voted against that quote unquote triangle down in my act on Cerro 70. Why? Not because it wasn't conforming, not because there wasn't use for commercial, but because of the safety of the ingress egress due to the speed on 70 and the, the safety issues associated with it. And I don't see this being any different. So I, I, I think people are voting the way they're voting, but just for the sake of at least a, attempting this, because I think it's the right thing to do, you know, I would 
propose an amended motion only for the approval of parcel A, which I'm supposed to ask uh, Ms. Shank to, to read off if there's a second, otherwise don't bother. Well, I'll, I'll second that. Well, with all due respect, Commissioner Cruz, I think we have to vote on the approval first, get that motion out of the way, Wait, and then... No, no, I, I'm making an amended motion to the motion. If you vote on the first motion and it's approved, then what am I doing here? I made yeah, the, He's making a hostile I'm amendment. I'm making an amended motion to the motion to only... Uh, to, okay, to make a motion okay. to only approve parcel A. Okay, I'll... It's a hostile I, amendment. Correct. Okay, I'll do it. Because it's not... Stay up, but just noting it for the record how we would do that. It would be... The second motion written in the staff report for approval of parcel <coughs> one, denial of parcel two, and specifically you only be approving one specific approval for the allowing the, the required five foot sidewalks to locate one side of the roadway. The other two specific approvals would be denied for parcel one. And in regard to parcel two, there would need to be a um, direction made to the county attorney and staff to prepare a written resolution containing written findings for a denial to be brought back at your March land use meeting. And this year at the March land use meeting, the zoning ordinance would be revised to reflect approval of only parcel one. And the public hearing would be kept open for those purposes on the March land use meeting. Thank you, Ms. Shank. Uh, Commissioner Whitmore, you're on the board, and I am still entertaining motions to call the question. <laughs> um, but I recommend... I respectfully ask that the board not support the hostile amendment and the reason why if you're going to build on Cortez Road from anywhere to 75th to the island either Manatee or Cortez you have to look whether you want to live there because people from all over the state of Florida are using those two roads to get to Anna Maria Island so I don't think because now all of a sudden we recognize that there's a lot of traffic so it's dangerous to turn left from somebody that you does this every day uh, and I respect your opinion but I, from somebody on the ground that actually goes you know uses that area I, I don't think that that's worth a hostile amendment and I'm gonna I'm not going to support the hostile amendment I will continue to support my motion it will not get bit, built if he doesn't have the Cortez access. And gotcha. when you buy somewhere, you know how to be careful. I mean, you know. Anyway, I'm done. Okay. Uh, so Mr. there are no chair. other mem there are no other commissioners on the board. So the chair will call the question. No, I, uh, um, same for second. Second. That's what I was going to do as well. Well, I don't. I don't need a second to do it. There's no one on the board. You don't. Uh, we're going to do a roll call vote as I anticipate a split decision. We will start with District Two this time. Mm -hmm. We are voting on the amendment first, which is for only phase one we and not we have to phase vote on the two. House. But we'll we'll vote on the amendment first, oh. and after the amendment, we'll vote on the original motion. So if you are in favor of the amendment, you'll say yes when your district is called. If you are opposed, you will say no. District two. No. District three is a yes. District four. No. District five. Yes. District six. Um, no. District seven. Yes. District 1. No. Madam Clerk, the motion fails 4 to 3. That was the most we will, organized we will one now, I've ever had. We will now vote on the original motion, which is for, as stated by our legal counsel, the whole enchilada. Uh, <laughs> we will start this time with District 3. District 3 is a no. District 4. Yes. District 5. Yes. District 6. Yes. District 7. Nope. District 1. Yes. District 2. Yes. Madam Clerk, <laughs> it passes 5 to 2. Before we start, can we ask the neighbors to work with the judge and their HOA? And the we will now recess this meeting for 10 minutes. Thank you. I was going to ask you to do that. Yeah.
Okay, we are back, and we're going to move on to the next agenda item. Ms. Shank, will you please introduce the next agenda item? This is item number five, application PDMU 1805 ZG Ellington Cove, quasi-issue public hearing, a proposed rezone of approximately 80.82 acres during located at the southwest corner of I-75 Mendoza Road, and commonly referred to as 5005 37th Street each, East from A1 Agricultural Suburban Zone District to the PDMU, Plan Development Mixed Use Zone District, and approving a general development plan with two alternative development options. Option A is for a maximum of 532 multifamily units, 78 single family detached units, and 30,000 square feet neighborhood commercial. And option B is for a maximum of 780 residential units and 30,000 square feet of neighborhood commercial uses, utilizing a mixed use density bonus. That's Thank I you. Have. Thank you, Ms. Shank. Commissioners, does anyone have any ex parte communications that they would like to disclose at this time? Okay, seeing none, we will go forward with the applicant presentation. Is the applicant here to present? Mr. Rudisil, long time no see. Uh, good morning again, commissioners. For the record, I'm Scott Rudisil um, with Blaylock Walters. I've been sworn, and I'm here on behalf of the applicant. All right, we're here today on the Ellington Cove project, which actually started uh, three years ago with a request for a comp plan amendment and rezone uh, to PDMU. It has changed a little bit since then, which we will uh, which we'll discuss here. Uh, it's our project team. Uh, Mr. Baruf is here along with Ms. Clark, uh, who's the project planner with Medallion Home. Uh, we also have Alex Anaya, who's our, our traffic engineer, and Sheila Tyree. Uh, also AICP with with height design. So this project is located at the southwest corner of Mendoza Road and I-75. Project contains six parcels totaling 80.82 acres. And if you'll recall, we kind of talked about when we came for the comp plan amendment that the project originally was just the two parcels on the eastern side. And he got some initial staff comments and they actually went and the applicant bought the four parcels to the west so that they could provide for a transition from the res nine to res six and and transitioning down from east to west so this shows the original future land use designation of the property it was res three um, and then this shows the designation this was approved by the board in june of last year with the res six and the res nine. And at that time, we talked about the fact that, I think we even showed a concept plan. We talked about the fact that the intent was to, to put the multifamily uses on the Eastern portion of the project and then have your, your lower density single family um, on the West. And, and so that's what we're back with today. Um, and with that, I'll turn it over to Ms. Clark. <clears throat> Good morning, Commissioners. I'm Carol Clark with Medallion Home. I've been sworn, and um, I am also an AICP member, and I came to the very strange realization that come June, I will have worked in and around local government for 50 years. Oh. Lord have mercy. God <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So you wrote that comp plan. No. <laughs> I had part to do with it. <laughs> so the zoning on this property has been A1 um, essentially since forever. Um, and going a little bit around the area, we've got Willow Walk to the north, uh, Willow Hammock, which is now Silverstone South, uh, also to the north, Trees Direct, um, Tuscany Lakes, Gulf Coast Factory Shops, and the Ice Skating Rink. Uh, the International Trade Port, which is 2.5 million square feet. Our Lives Community, which has a combination of uses, including residential and office and industrial. Um, and the paddocks, which has not yet been built. So you can see that this area is, and I'm going to go back to that one, is really surrounded by 
incoming development. And as I did the research for the comp plan amendment and the rezoning, it was interesting how this portion of the county has kind of been left and there was a jump to, uh, to the east, um, but now this is now surrounded. So other thing that's important in the comprehensive plan is the proposed future thoroughfare plan. This property has a future thoroughfare going through it. It is bisected. <coughs> and in this portion of the county, access north-south is difficult. We think we're actually helping to solve that problem by providing that right-of-way. And here's uh, another picture of that. So part of the right-of-way has been constructed and it's planned. Um, our proposal is for PDMU, Plan Development Mixed Use. Um, we have two options before you. Option A is 532 multifamily units located on the east side, 72 single family on the west side, and 30,000 square feet of neighborhood commercial, which would be at the intersection but could be on either side. This is a prettier picture. Um, that's colored in. So we've got, in this case, we've got the commercial on the, um, uh, on the east side. 532 multifamily units, which would be uh, four stories, um, 78 single family units. And uh, here is that closer view, 6,000 square feet, minimum lot width of 50 feet, maximum of two stories for the single family in option A. And again, a closer view of the multifamily. This is the neighborhood commercial. It is pr proposed for standard neighborhood commercial uses, um, nail salons. Um, I think you could actually probably fit in Aldi there, which I think is 16,000 square feet, but um, it's relatively small. One of the things that we learned, and this is one of those cases where I get to go my bad, um, as Scott said, this project was started three years ago. And when this project was started, the idea of an activity node was not really thought about. But it's in the plan, um, and this is the intersection of two thoroughfares. We have the road coming through us and Mendoza. And so this shows the option B, and all but 11 acres of this property is within an activity node. And those are the areas that are on the, um, uh, the south, eastern, and western portions. So what we're proposing is we heard the discussion at the, when we came to the board in April of last year, suggesting this would be a good place for additional density. So as we came forward, and poor Charlie, he got surprised because <laughs> when we submitted the application, um, we had a meeting with him that day and said, oh, by the way, what we thought we we're going to do, we're now going to use the activity center mixed use bonus. So we're proposing 780 units, still keeping the 30,000 square feet of commercial, um, and the Multifamily can only be located on the east side of the project. Single family on the west side, but it could be single family attached, detached, semi-detached, um, and limited to two stories on the west side of the project. And here is um, an example of that. This shows, um, um, it says 780 units, but this is a single family semi-detached project. Um, and we have the single family detached, could be 30 feet, uh, lot width, semi-detached 25, attached 16 feet, which is similar to what else has been approved. And the multifamily um, side, the, the east side, could also have the single family detached, attached. We do think it's gonna be uh, multifamily, though. Um, we're asking for specific approval to eliminate the requirement that multifamily have to be located with the buildings facing the street. That was a urban corridor requirement, and we've had to deal with that in several other cases. Also, to reduce the front yard 
um, set back from 25 feet to 23 feet for single family detached and to um, uh, reduce the number of required parking spaces for multifamily to 1.8. We will have to come back when we come forward with a final site plan to prove up that that makes sense for the project we're actually proposing. Um, this is consistent with a comprehensive plan. In many cases, we are um, within the future development area boundary. We are doing development intensities and densities that are consistent with the comprehensive plan. And um, we think this is going to be a good project um, and think that what we propose is compatible. And we did have several neighborhood meetings um, back when we did the comprehensive plan and we made a commitment that we would do another neighborhood meeting when we were doing the rezoning. So we did a Zoom meeting January 6th. We sent out letters to everyone within 500 feet. I had a separate meeting um, with folks who could not do the Zoom meeting. Um, actually, I had breakfast with them um, across <laughs> on the river, uh, which is a really nice place. Mila's on the manatee. Uh, so we had a, a, a good meeting um, talking about that. And so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Scott, see if he has any more questions. I actually don't have anything else. Uh, we did get a recommendation of approval from the Planning Commission. We're asking for your approval and happy to answer any questions. All right. Thank you, Mr. Rudisil. Uh, Commissioner Servia, questions for the applicant? Just a quick question about the entranceway. So our, does it meet all the standards that we have in the code of the entranceway? I'm, I'm looking at the plan, and it says if within the entranceway it will meet like 30% open space, and I know there's a number of them. Well, only part of the project, this is Carol Clark again, only part of the project is within the entranceway. Okay. So the portion that is within the entranceway will meet all of those requirements. Okay, okay, thank you. That's my only question right now, thanks. Okay, seeing no other questions for the applicant, we'll move on to staff presentation. Hi, good morning, Commissioners. Charles Andrews, Senior Planner uh, with Building Development Services, and I have been sworn. Uh, the applicant did a great job of touching on all the points here. Uh, just a few things I'll just run through here real quick. Um, location of the site. Uh, was previously approved for a comprehensive plan amendment uh, from Res 3 to Res 6 and Res 9. Uh, let's see here. Uh, A1 zoning. Okay, so... Uh, and touching on Commissioner Servia's uh, question there, this is the uh, zoning map here with the entranceway, the I-75 entranceway, just showing uh, how much of it. It's on that um, kind of that magenta crosshatch there on the eastern side of the property. Uh, let's see, the request was a rezone with general development plan approval for two alternative development options, options A and B uh, to PDMU. Uh, a little discussion here on the activity node. Uh, with the Res 6 and Res 9 future land use classifications, it can be within 1,500 feet, two functionally classified roadways. That'd be Mendoza Road and 49th Avenue East Extension. Uh, real quick, the comprehensive plan allows for an increase in density for residential uses at a mixed-use development within an activity node. Uh, here is a graphic similar to what the applicant had provided, uh, just showing you that the majority of the site is within that activity node there. Andrew, you can... You don't have to rush through this. You can oh, slow down okay. just a little bit. Sorry. Thanks. No problem. Just <laughs> first time. No, no, no. There you go. All right. Let's see. So option A, as they discussed, 532 multifamily units, uh, 78 single family detached, 30,000 gross, uh, 30,000 square feet uh, neighborhood commercial uses, gross density 7.84 dwelling units per acre uh, with an assisted living facility at 1 0 FAR. Uh, and like I was saying, um, they have option A and option B. Uh, real quick here on a graphic, uh, the 49th Avenue East Extension, that's serving as the east-west boundary there. So on the east, you would have the multifamily uses, and then on the west, you'd have the single-family detached. Uh, and then at that intersection there, you could have the commercial, neighborhood <coughs> commercial uses on either side. Uh, option B was the 780 residential units uh, with the mixed-use density increase, also including the 30,000 square feet of neighborhood commercial uses, Gross density of 10.02 dwelling units per acre uh, with the assisted living facility at 1.0 FAR. 
Uh, there's a little breakdown there. It's on the site plan as well. Uh, on the east side here, just to note, the, the thicker green line denotes the uh, they're, they're offering up a 100-foot wide uh, buffer for the entranceway there along I-75. Uh, we also have the 15-foot uh, uh, greenway buffer, or, or excuse me, um, green belt buffer, rather, along the western property boundary and the roadway buffer is there along 49th Avenue East Extension, which I believe would be 20 feet as well. Uh, just to show you kind of how it's all buffered up there with the proposal. Uh, the specific approvals, the applicant already touched on these. Uh, let's see here. Surrounding development, applicant already addressed those. Uh, to the north, we've got Willow Hammock and Willow Walk. To the south, we have larger tract residential lots, uh, one to eight acres in size. Uh, to the east, across uh, I-75, we've got the Tuscany Lake Apartments. That's a picture of that facility. Uh, to the west, we do have uh, directly west and adjacent of the site, we have a single-family detached lot. But on the other side of that, about 325 feet to the west, we have Tidewell uh, facility. Uh, a few public facilities in the area, we have Blackburn Elementary, Buffalo Creek Middle, and Palmetto High uh, for schools. Uh, the nearest transit is east of the site across I-75 at the Tuscany Lakes Apartment Complex. Uh, several parks in the area there, including Ga Glam uh, excuse me, Gamble Plantation, Buffalo Creek Park. Uh, some positive aspects of the project proposal. Uh, we have timing appears to be consistent with the development trends in the nearby area, uh, serving as infill development. Uh, the PDMU allows the board to accept voluntarily pro-offered uh, proposed stipulations to ensure compatibility. Uh, negative aspect, just that there are lower established uh, density residential subdivisions to the north, uh, Willow Walk that I touched on. Uh, some mitigating factors, proposed extension of 49th Avenue East will require green belt buffers along the roadway, providing further compatibility through buffering and screening between the proposed uses. Uh, any potential adverse impacts to adjacent property owners, such as no noise, lighting, etc., will be addressed at the time of preliminary site plan, final site plan submittal. Uh, last mitigating factor here, that eastern portion of the site that I touched on is uh, located within the designated entranceway of I-75 and it would adhere to Land Development Code Section 900 for entranceways. Uh, in conclusion, the request appears to meet applicable policies of the Manatee County Comprehensive Plan and the Land Development Code regulations. Uh, and our, that was our uh, basically our conclusion. That's uh, compatible. And I'm here if you have any questions. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, well done. I have Commissioners Whitmore and Servia are the order of the board. Commissioner Whitmore. Andrew, good job. Is this your first time presenting to us? Uh, well, maybe, uh, second time, I believe. Second time, yes. OK. All right, good job. Very thorough. You got to the point, and that's what we like. OK. I have to ask Rosina. I noticed there's sniffs in, in a lot of the um, language, skilled nursing facilities, assisted living facilities. Did we? Are they still in the criteria? We haven't changed it because they're still considered under the code with hospitals. Remember, we were going to ask to have the uh, codes changed on that. Are we in the process of doing that? And is it, any of that going to affect this property? I don't think so, Commissioner, because uh, no the blood. site is not immediately adjacent. And I researched after we have the briefing with you. It's a residential par two residential parcels adjacent to the west. And after that is the tie well. Okay. The site is not immediately adjacent, and the buffer that I'm proposing is... Um, yeah, I wasn't talking about Tidewell. In their language, they have the use to... It was either ALFs or skilled nursing. Uh, for, it, for the ALF, it's still a residential use. We don't have any so change. Okay. It's still a residential use, but according to the regulation for the state, we have to calculate it, no number of beds. We use right now Florida ratio as has this data for the state of Florida. The reason why this came to my attention again is because I know actually it's been Carol Clark and I've been trying, and I agree 100% as a care provider, health care provider, that hospitals are totally different than assisted living skilled nursings, and we were going to change that coding. And that's when I saw this again. Uh, this will be a, I'll bring this up under comments if I need to, but we need to get that moving and the attorney uh, can. We need to. Bring it up. Uh, not, not on this, but yeah. Ms. Lisa Wenzel and figure out. Keep the differences yes. separate. Okay. Mr. Chair, I, I just wanted to answer directly. The code definitions for system facility, they're all up to date. They all comply with the state statute. No. Yeah, we update those. What you're talking about is it comes to plan amendment issue. Exactly. Exactly. Separate from code, not land around the code. Yeah, sorry, comp plan. Thank you, Ms. Shank. Can I answer that, that question? I think the issue deals with 
how in the Land Development Code, acute care medical facilities includes hospitals, nursing homes, yeah. and assisted living facilities. And actually, Mr. Baruf and I had a meeting just yesterday on that. So yes, that's still on our radar of things that need to get done. That is 100% incorrect. Acute care is not skilled, independent, long-term. Thank you, Commissioner Whitmore. Commissioner Servia. Yes, um, maybe this is just a comment or I don't know, maybe it's a question for staff. Um, so, so this site is up against a major thoroughfare and of course our interstate and designed in such a way that it's going to have a pretty urbanized feel. I mean, the single family development is going to have a 30 foot wide lot with five foot setbacks. So I'm just asking, does our code allow for the, for the applicant to bring in a product that would be pushed all the way to the street instead of this 23 foot setback? Because, I don't know, I just think it would be a better looking project if it were all up against the street rather than having this little tiny piece of grass that somebody has to mow and in that very urbanized development. So that, that's just, maybe that's just a comment. I hope that we allow that. If we don't allow that, I would like for us to allow that and even encourage that, um, that type of design. All right, thank you, Commissioner Servia. Commissioner Cruz. Just for policy's sake, I, I completely agree with what Commissioner Servia just said. I would be fully in favor of that, either on this project or, or for future changes. All right, thank you, Commissioner Cruz. Seeing no other commissioners on the board, I'm going to move to public comment on this item. And I do have two cards. Um, I have Conley and Sudeby, I believe. And I could be completely butchering your last name, and I apologize. People do that to me all the time. Um, so we'll start with what looks like uh, Donna Conley. No, but OK, I'm doing my best. So when you come forward, you'll have three minutes to speak. We ask that you keep your comments directed specifically to this agenda item. Please state your name and your county of residence. Uh, my name is Donna Cooley, C-O-O-L-E-Y. I wrote it fast, so uh, I am a resident of Manatee, and I have been sworn. And thank you, commissioners, for this time. Um, I really enjoyed today's meetings. <laughs> it's, been, it's been enlightening. Uh, three issues I have with this uh, development. One is traffic, traffic, traffic. The other one, um, has there been any environmental report on this property here? And the third is uh, <coughs> affordable housing considerations. Uh, traffic was discussed in January at length. And uh, once again, um, Manatee, uh, uh, Mendoza Road is two lanes. And um, since uh, 2015, we've had um, two developments there. Um, Willow Walk has over six, 700 um, buildings. And then you've got Silverstone South and now Silverstone North, which is going on to Ellington Gillette. That's over 1,400 um, um, buildings there. So you, talking about traffic, yes, it's, it's bad. And put another 700, you know, depending on which, which option they have. That's asking a lot for the small um, road of Mendoza. And um, I just take that in consideration. Uh, there's no place for the road to expand um, because uh, you've got the storm drains and uh, you do have uh, turning lanes for those two developments. but. It, it gets pretty bad. Uh, fortunately, I'm retired and I don't have to go out at the peak areas, but take that into consideration and it was thoroughly discussed in Jan January. The second one was environmental impact. Um, has there been any studies done on that? I live just to the west of a uh, hospice facility and I live on a big pond and noticed uh, a few uh, changes since they've been building there since 2015 with uh, wildlife and stuff. I'm just wondering if there's been any environmental impact studies done on this. <clears throat> so that was one concern. And the other one was um, affordable housing. Um, you can't change, you can't stop progress and growth. And I know uh, Florida is developing very, very fast. And with development, you have uh, other things that need to be done as far as uh, retail and um, 
uh, health care and stuff, and these people are coming in. Not these people. These people can't afford $300,000, $400,000. Consideration of affordable housing. I'm in an uh, organization now where, um, for Mandy County, we're looking into uh, providing more ho affordable housing in Manatee County. And um, it's really opened my eyes as far as, you know, people that are here that can't afford $300,000 homes. So um, I'm also concerned about the affordable housing uh, options in this project too. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Ms. Cooley. Uh, next is Tracy Subedy. And please state your name, your county of residence. You have three minutes and stay on this agenda item. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Tracy Sedeby. I've been sworn and I'm a resident of Manatee County. Um, good morning, ladies and gentlemen of the County Commission Board. Uh, the Planning Board seemed very concerned at the uh, amount of traffic that will be generated on Mendoza Road by the Ellington Cove development. Uh, the 49th Avenue Arterial Road will also connect to this development and others to the south. This will be a dangerous traffic situation to the residents that live along Mendoza Road. Also to the traffic coming west over the overpass. This development is 10 plus units per acre with apartment buildings, commercial buildings, and homes on 80 acres. This is excessive. Mendoza Road is a two-lane road and cannot handle this excessive amount of traffic. This should be residential without apartments or commercial buildings limited to two to three units per acre. The traffic is already back past my driveway and we're at eighth of a mile <coughs> uh, just east of the uh, Ellington Gillette and Mendoza Road intersection. <coughs> uh, this is an emergency vehicle nightmare and there's no place to pull off the road in a life-threatening situation. <clears throat> I would also like a six-foot bermed landscape wall on the western boundary of the development here <clears throat> to mitigate the noise and construction to us as neighbors and to hospice. This will also mitigate the visual effects of seeing an I-75 traffic and the traffic on 49th Avenue. I also would like this t uh, to be a no-burn property as the breakwater development being built close to the Ellington Outlet Mall, as we have Juvenile Eagle in distress last year due to the burning on this property. Please do not burn on this property. We have a 10-acre lake with nesting birds such as great blue herons and egrets and ducks and other birds that use this lake to fish in. Therefore, low lighting <coughs> in this development would be greatly appreciated. As an alternative solution, I believe that this land would be better suited for something like a solar grid, which would look cool from the interstate and make Manatee County look like a progressive community. Sarasota has Benderson Park and Moat Marine soon. What will we showcase? Apartment buildings? And as a last thing, um, again, just because there's a hole in the donut doesn't mean you have to fill it. And sometimes when you fill it and you pick it up, all you're left with is a mess. Thank you. Thank you. All right, thank you, ma'am. Is there anyone else in the audience who has not filled out a card but would like to come forward to speak on this item? All right, seeing no one, we're going to move into closing statements by the applicant. I'm sorry, by staff. Closing statements by staff. Yeah, we'll do closing statements by staff, then we'll do the applicant, and then deliberation. Good morning again, Commissioners. Charles Andrews with staff. I have been sworn. Uh, just to touch on a few things here that the public had uh, mentioned uh, regarding the traffic. Uh, at the Planning Commission meeting uh, back in January, uh, it was stated that the extension of 49th Avenue East would alleviate those traffic congestion uh, issues that are occurring out there to help out that area. Uh, regarding the environmental narrative comment, uh, that's on page 14 of the report or page 314 of your agenda packet. And that uh, narrative was done by Steinbaum and Associates back in September of 2021. Uh, regarding the affordable housing comment, 
Uh, there can be an increase, per the comprehensive plan, there could be an increase uh, in density if you're located at the activity node, which the applicant had discussed, or if you allocate 25% for affordable housing, just to uh, discuss, or just to throw that out there real quick. So just want to mention those three items there. Okay, thank you, Andrew. Uh, Mr. Rudisil, would you like to make a final statement before we move to deliberation? Oh, I, I don't have anything else unless any, there are any questions from the board. Commissioner Servi, is your question for the, the applicant or de, for uh, deliberation? I just would like to get some information on the record for the benefit of the citizens who came down to speak today. Um, so there was a question about the environmental narrative. If somebody could just summarize that for the record. I don't know if Michelle Steinbaum is here or can do that. Okay. And... Um, and right-of-way needs, you know, I don't know if, if you guys have that in your traffic impact statement, but if you could kind of summarize those needs, um, yeah, that would be great. Okay. Do you want to do the... Yeah, I can. Um, Carol Clark again. We did have a question about environmental impact at our neighborhood Zoom meeting, um, and we do not anticipate any wetland impacts save for... I think it's less than half an acre for the construction of the road. Um, and our plan is, in fact, to construct the road to our southerly entrance that we will be using on for that. And did the report talk about habitat at all? Were there, were there any habitat concerns? I, or? I do not think so, no. Okay. Okay. After the right away, stip. I have one more question. I think there's a stip about gopher tortoise relocation, um, so that would be part of the process when we get to final site plan. Um, there's a question about the roads. Or we're not getting concurrency now, but as Carol mentioned, we are providing for a new, you know, the extension of a new north-south thoroughfare in that area, which we think will help alleviate some of those issues. Do you think additional right-of-way is going to be required on Mendoza? I don't think there's additional right-of-way needed on Mendoza, but we would provide that if we needed to. Okay, and then my final question is, can you explain uh, the affordable housing information? So, of course, we need affordable housing in this community, and it is um, pretty much market-driven, and we're seeing affordable housing come forward. Um, but is I don't believe that the state of Florida allows communities to mandate affordable housing, but I'm not the expert, so I just want, wondered if you could please talk about that. Sure. Um, yes, the state prohibits exclusionary um, zoning and requirements for affordable housing, um, but Manatee County does offer um, incentives to do affordable housing that, that has not been requested on this project. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Servia. I have Satcher and Whitmore on the board. Commissioner Satcher. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I have a couple of questions uh, and comments. They'll probably be for um, the applicant, I would imagine. Um, first of all, can you just remind me the acres versus units the, for the, when we saw you in what, January versus the acres and the units now? Because you've added to the property, but you also added units. I think the only the only additional units beyond what was presented would be the option B, which is the um, the additional units for the density bump in the activity center for mixed use. For the mixed use, okay. Right. For the bonus there, um, and then this the road is it? Do you have agreements or whatever it takes? Are you going to be able to punch it all the way through to the south, or you're kind of waiting on other people? I mean, that group that's building those. Uh, you know, those warehouses, is, they're getting a lot done, so I'm... Right. I mean, but between the trade port and, and this project, and Clark may be a better one to answer, but I, I think there there is a gap. Obviously, we don't control that property or have any ability to do anything, but um, I think there is a gap right now between those two projects. And again, Carol Clark, I've been sworn, um, we are working on doing what we can to make that happen. Yeah. I, I think that I hope that, and, and let me know if we need anything from the county to make that happen. That would be a uh, just a really uh, good thing for the community. We do need north-south connection. We've got so many roads that go almost to where you need to be um, in that area, in the Ellington and Parrish area, but especially Ellington, it seems like. Um, 
So I appreciate you working on that. And um, and you're not going. There's no sidewalk over 75 there, just for the, you know. So um, so it's going to be tough for people to really utilize that. Maybe we could uh, start looking at that. Um, and and then just for policy considerations, moving. Uh, we talked about. Uh, the staff mentioned catching the bus on the other side, on the east side, um, where Tuscany Lakes is. Now, I assume we would add a stop at some point. If we're going to add this, you know, this many units, I would assume the bus would be able to pick up somewhere else. But as it stands now, they mentioned the access to public transportation. Would you be, go across to tu Tuscany Lakes? But that's an, that's an exciting bridge to walk. I wouldn't want to walk it. Um, so just pointing that out. Um, and then for policy considerations, I think if we're going to build stuff, it's okay to give somebody five feet of grass at least. So um, that has nothing to do with this application. But just for moving forward, I've found that I better say stuff early or the train can, uh, the train can get moving. So all right, thank you. That's all I have. Okay. Thank you, Commissioner Satcher. Commissioner Whitmore. Um, yes, um, the applicant, can you just state for the record so that the assist citizens feel like their concerns are being addressed? I know um, Ms. Clark had said if needed, we'll take care of the right away and other. Isn't there ordinances in the county that you have to comply with? I mean, it sounds like we're going ahead and go ahead and do whatever you want, but they have to go through another process. And if you could explain that so the residents know that we just, we're approving this, but it has to go through many steps of approvals and complying with our laws and the state laws. Right. So uh, the county's code does require us to provide any right of way needs that are shown on the county's future thoroughfare plan. So that will be done uh, as part of the process. That right of way will be reserved and can be utilized as needed. And could you also state the same with wildlife? Um, we have an ordinance to protect our species and the requirements for all development. Can you explain kind of briefly so the citizens feel rest assured about that? I mean, we're primarily on the, on the wildlife side. We're dealing with federal regulations as far as what we can do with threatened and protected species. And so we, there's a stipulation on all the projects that we have to comply with. And with we have that. ordinances that require you to do that, correct? And then the staff, next time we come forward, we will have to do, update that study, right? So that you know, if for some reason endangered species have decided this is the place they want to live, we have to come and do a study before we actually construct. Okay. And also, can you um, um, acknowledge or whatever that there are compliances for noise and lighting? We, from what I've heard, since I've been up here for so long, at one point we had probably one of the strictest um, noise ordinances in, a lot, uh, in other um, surrounding counties. But can you um, testify as the, the uh, applicant that you're complying with Manatee County's ordinances on noise and lighting? Yes, we've not asked for any deviation from the county's requirements for noise or lighting. Now, there is a hospice, whether they have clients there or not. Uh, we when you have a surrounding neighborhood or a residential next door, there are strict rules on how we direct the lighting to the project and not outside the project, correct? correct? Okay. I just wanted the neighbors to know that just because you're hearing us approve that, there's many steps they have to comply with. Thank you. All right, thank you, Commissioner Whitmore. Commissioner Servia. Yeah, so um, just a, a few final comments. You know, doing residential development near I-75 is difficult. And it's difficult because of the noise. And, um, you know, you, there, you, it's difficult to do single family uh, and multifamily. But multifamily is certainly very appropriate next to the interstate. And in this case, I see that there's a 100-foot buffer that you guys are providing, which is a pretty standard buffer to help mitigate the noise. And then there's some construction uh, techniques that may or may not be required. But um, we have, I think there's multifamily across the street, across I-75. Um, and so, yeah, so I really like the layout. I'm very happy that you included a mixed use component. Thank you for bringing commercial to the area as well. That helps us on the whole roadway network. Um, and, you know, I just ask, and I know you guys do this, but please be very sensitive 
to the neighborhood as they live there and as construction goes on. Um, we all want to be good neighbors, and there are challenges uh, when you're developing land. But this is an appropriate project. It does meet all of our regulations, and I am going to support it. Thanks. Thank you, Commissioner Servia. Seeing no other commissioners on the board, I'll entertain motions. Mr. Chairman, I move to approve second. the recommended motion. We have a motion by Commissioner Baugh to approve and a second by Commissioner Cruz. Uh, all in favor of the motion say aye. 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 All opposed? Madam Clerk, motion passes unanimously. All right, thank you, Commissioners. We will. That is our last agenda item, so we'll move into Commissioner comments. Uh, Commissioner Servia, I believe District 4 goes first today. Okay, I go first. So I don't think I have any comments, but I'll let you know at the end if I think of one I forgot. Thanks. District 5. Uh, I would only say that we had an MPOAC meeting uh, last Thursday, and um, we were very fortunate. I was uh, voted in as the vice chair, um, and I'm not sure that what's going on with our chairman, who is Nick Maddox in Tallahassee, um, but uh, anyway, it could change. I don't know. We'll see. Thank okay. you. Thank you, Commissioner Baugh. District 6. Nothing. District 7. Nope. I'm good. Thanks. District 1. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to point out um, that l at last time I saw, she was in the lead uh, for being Athlete of the Week, uh, Kendall Heck from, uh, from Parish Community High School and just an excellent soccer player. That whole team, they just won their division and are headed to the playoffs. So very exciting times and get on there and, and vote. It's one time I'd say to go to the newspaper. Other what, than that, stay away from the newspaper. What <laughs> website do they need to go to to vote for? I would agree. <laughs> I think it's the... I what think website? it's the Herald Tribune. The Herald Tribune. I'm not gonna, they're they're going to have to Google it. Okay. Uh, we're going to Parish Parents Network and check it out. Thank you, Commissioner Satcher. Uh, District 2. Uh, exciting. Some resurfacing started in District 2 in a major area um, uh, in, in Palmetto. We've kind of been working on that. And I always make sure I look each one of you all in the eye and tell you all thanks for the support. Some things have really changed the face of our community. So exciting opportunity for us. And I will say to Commissioner Satcher, if you continue to have these highlights about Paris Community High School, <laughs> you're going to force that cane pride that sits in a lot of us up here to come out. So I'd like you to proceed with caution. <laughs> A little bit different. We're trying to Thank establish you. to get where you're you at. about all the championships you're winning, too. <laughs> Thank you, Commissioner <laughs> Bellamy. <laughs> I'm done. Touche. Thank you, Commissioner Bellamy. I would just thank the commission. Well, we didn't agree on everything today. We had a very effective, productive meeting and got a lot done. And I will see you again on Tuesday at our regular meeting. For today, we are adjourned. <laughs>